Good morning. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Today we are having an oversight hearing on the preparations for early voting made by the New York City Board of Election and the Administration of Poll Science Interpretation Services by BOE, and the New York City's Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs in conjunction with Democracy NYC. The committee will additionally hold a first hearing on Introduction 1282, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, in relation to the Voter Assistant Advisory Committee providing poll science interpreters in all designated citywide languages. In 2019, the New York State Legislature passed legislation to enact early voting statewide. The state legislature fiscal year 2020 budget also included $10 million for in, in implementing early voting as well as $14.7 million for boards for boards of election for the board of election to purchase electronic poll books. In March, this committee heard testimony from New York City Board of Elections Executive Director Michael Ryan. During that hearing, he said that the cost of implementing early voting will be substantial and that numerous issues regarding implementation still needed to be resolved. This committee is interested in receiving an update from the city BOE on its continuing plans to implement early voting. We will also hear from the city's BOE and the administration regarding poll sites interpretation. Over 200 languages are spoken by New York City residents, 23.1 of whom are limited English proficient, meaning they speak less than, quote unquote, very well. Limited English proficiency affects all aspects of life, but especially New Yorkers' ability to engage in the democratic process. Pursuant to federal law, the city's BOE has being required to provide poll site interpretation in Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Asian Indi Indian languages. Since 2017, the administration has separately offered its own poll site interpreters, most recently offering interpreters from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs at 100 poll sites during the 2018 general election. These interpreters offers assistance to voters in languages not provided by cities by city BOE. Russian, Haitian Creole, Italian, Arabic, Polish, Jewish. Whether these interpreters should be allowed within the BOE poll site has been the subject of litigation between the city and BOE. At the 2018 general election, voters also approved ballot proposal number two, which established a civic engagement commission tasked with establishing a program for providing language interpreters at poll sites beginning with the 2020 general election. Introduction 1282 will amend the New York City's charter to require the Voter Assistant Advisory Committee, an independent body that advises the Campaign Finance Board, to provide interpreters at poll sites in designated city-wide languages. These 10 languages are Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Bengali, Russian, Haitian Creole, Polish, French, Urdu, and Arabic. However, under the bill, VAC will not provide interpreters for, for those languages which the city, city BOE is already providing interpreter. Let me just uh, advise everyone that next door in the cafeteria, we have a demonstration also from e ESS and Dominion voting system of uh, electronic voting machines, balance on demand system and electronic poll books which will be discussed uh, in this hearing, so feel free, you could uh, test them yourself. I'm looking forward to a productive conversation about the many ways in which the city BOE, the mayor's office, the city engagement commission, and the CFB are working to make voting accessible for all New Yorkers. I would like to thank committee staff, I really do, whose work made this hearing possible. Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjom, Charlotte Mar uh, Martin, and our finance analyst Sebastian Bacci, as well as my own legislative director Claire McLevain. I will turn it over to my colleague Councilmember Traeger to make a statement on his bill. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I am pleased uh, to be here to testify on my bill, Intro 1282, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to providing poll site interpreters in all designated citywide languages. Thanks to Chair uh, Cabrera for holding this hearing uh, oversight on voting uh, implementation and poll site interpretation in New York City. Voting is such an important right, and everyone who is able to vote should be able to do so. There is a narrative in New York City after every election where folks shout, voting rates in New York City are abysmal. More people should vote. But why aren't people voting? For many New Yorkers, it comes down to the fact that the Board of Elections has failed to provide language accommodations that reflect the linguistic diversity of our city. This service gap is reflected starkly in low voter turnout in neighborhoods with high concentrations of limited English proficient naturalized citizens. If we want people to vote, we have to make sure voting is accessible. My bill would make sure that where appropriate and necessary, interpreters would be provided at poll sites for the 10 most commonly spoken languages in New York City, which includes adding interpreters for New Yorkers who speak Russian, Haitian Creole, Arabic, Urdu, French, and Polish. The Board of Elections provides interpreters in four languages, Chinese, Spanish, Korean, and Bengali, as mandated by Section 203 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. But I want to make it clear that the Voting Rights Act is the floor, the bare minimum that is required. Because the Voting Rights Act has an arcane and exclusionary definition of a language minority, thousands of people's suffrage rights in our, in our city have been ignored. Voters have been repeatedly disenfranchised, especially in boroughs like mine. Other cities readily provide language support. Our city can and should be providing interpretation for at least the top 10 languages spoken in our city. In addition to adding interpreters, my bill also makes it clear that interpreters should be stationed inside of poll sites. Let me repeat, interpreters should be stationed inside of poll sites, not outside in the freezing cold rain. As folks may know, the Board of Elections is currently suing the city to keep interpreters 100 or more feet away from the polling site entrance. Why is that? Because the Board of Elections has falsely classified language access, which is already happening at a much more robust level in many cities throughout our nation, to be electioneering. Language access is not electioneering. In 2017, I worked with then Speaker Melissa Mark Beverito and the mayor's office to launch a pilot program for Russian and Haitian Creole translators at 15 poll sites in southern Brooklyn. In 2018, the program was expanded and interpreters were at 101 poll sites. But interpreters, again, were forced to be 100 feet away from polling sites and had to wait in the cold rain. Other cities have a humane, common sense approach to language access. Why can't New York City integrate language access in a humane and logical way? In 2018, one of the ballot proposals was to create a civic engagement commission. One of the requirements was that the commission establish a program to provide language interpreters at city poll sites uh, to be implemented for the general election in 2020. I just want to note for the record that I have been working on this issue and on my bill for several years. Currently, my bill would amend the New York City Charter in relation to the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee providing poll site interpreters in all designated citywide languages. But I want to be clear, wherever this program is housed, there needs to be clear methodology. This is clear methodology extrapolated from the Voting Rights Act. In a city where hundreds of languages are spoken, where 40% of the population is made up of immigrants, and where nearly half of the population speaks a language other than English or English and another language at home, failing to provide adequate language access at polling places is nothing short of voter suppression. Providing increased language access and interpreter services at poll sites is a step toward a more inclusive democratic process, 
one that leads to higher voter turnout rates by making voting easier and more accessible for more New Yorkers. And I look forward to this hearing. Thank you, Chair, for your time. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your leadership uh, in this issue. You've really been a vanguard. Uh, let me just recognize we're being joined by council members myself, uh, Chaim and Powers, and this morning we'll have our first panel from Democracy NYC, Irene Fonseca Sabun, and from the uh, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, uh, Bida Mustafi. And we'll have the council share them in. You could both raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, Chair Cabrera. And members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Rini Fonseca Sabuni, and I'm the Chief Democracy Officer for the City of New York, where I work on Democracy NYC in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives. I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify before you today on early voting and the proposed poll site interpreter bill. I'm joined by my colleague, Commissioner Bita Mustafi of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. The Democracy NYC initiative is aimed at increasing voter registration, participation, and civic engagement in New York City. Democracy NYC was first announced by Mayor Bill de Blasio in his 2018 State of the City Address, detailing a robust 10-point plan to make New York City the fairest, most civically engaged big city in America. Democracy NYC was founded with the guiding principle of increasing public engagement in the democratic process. We have to make elections more fair and accessible to all New York City residents. Early voting is a major critical step toward achieving this goal and one that the mayor has long championed, including in both his 2018 and 2019 State of the City addresses. The administration is extremely pleased that this past January, the New York legislature passed legislation enacting early voting and then followed up by allocating funds for its implementation in the state budget earlier this spring. In time for the November 20, 2019 general election, Early voting will be a reality for New Yorkers, joining 37 other states and the District of Columbia, which already provide one form or another of early voting. New York is finally catching up. We anticipate that if it is well implemented, early voting can and will help in alleviating some of the election day issues that have historically arisen in New York City, particularly in major federal election years. Nationally in 2016, Roughly one-third of all votes in the presidential election were cast before Election Day, even though not all states had early voting. In some states, more than half of voters turn out early. Youth voters, a traditionally low-participating group, are particularly engaged by early voting. If a significant percentage of New York City voters vote during the early voting period, we may be able to reduce some of the strain that we see on our election day systems that has led to breakdowns at polling places. Lines will be shorter, poll sites will be less crowded, voters will have the privacy they deserve and which is required by law. The impact of machine malfunctions will be ameliorated since voters will have flexibility about when they vote and poll workers will be better able to provide the assistance requested in a timely fashion. Further, there is evidence that early voting is correlated with an increase in voter participation, one of the key aims of Democracy NYC. In last November's midterm elections, the 13 highest voting states had some form of early voting or are exclusively vote-by-mail jurisdictions. Allowing people to vote on their own time will hopefully result in more New York City voters casting ballots. Democracy NYC believes that New York City should have a robust early voting program from its inception. At minimum, this means guaranteeing that there are enough sites in each borough located in a logical way to serve as broad and diverse an array of New York City voters as possible. Early voting sites must be located as close as possible to accessible public transportation, keeping commuter traffic patterns in mind. Of course, early voting poll sites must also comply with all legal requirements for accessibility, 
and privacy for eligible voters and must be staffed with well-trained election inspectors and poll clerks. Consistent with the mission of Democracy NYC, we are pleased that the guiding principles of the new state law appear to be equity and accessibility. The City Board of Elections is due to announce the locations of its 2019 early voting poll sites by May 1st tomorrow. The administration has made itself available as a partner to work as closely as possible with the board to help ensure the success of early voting in New York City. Just last week, the mayor announced an allocation of $75 million for early voting for the FY20 election cycle in his executive budget plan. This would support a robust early voting program for New York City. We believe that the minimum number of sites of seven per county is not sufficient to accommodate the needs of voters in New York City. For example, under this formulation, Kings County, the most populous county in the state, would have the same number of poll sites as upstate counties, which have uh, five times as few registered voters. Regardless of the initial number of poll sites selected, we hope that, as specifically contemplated, the board will consider expanding the program in future years, adding more poll sites, expanding voting hours, taking other appropriate steps to ensure that the program can best meet the needs of New York City voters. The administration looks forward to the release of a thorough and ambitious communications plan from the board to ensure public awareness of early voting and to maximize voter participation in the program and alleviate the long lines and broken machines that have become all too common on election day in New York City. Early voting will ensure access to the ballot by allowing the flexibility to vote that our busy lives require. We expect that many New Yorkers will be eager to take advantage of this new opportunity and hope that the number of poll sites will be sufficient to accommodate a high volume of voters. Democracy NYC applauds the state government for finally making early voting a reality, and we pledge to work closely with our partners in government, nonprofit, and community-based groups to make the program a success in our city. As you are all aware, the administration is also deeply committed to supporting voters with limited English proficiency. And as Commissioner Mustafi will describe in greater detail, has established a poll site interpreter project to provide interpreters at poll sites throughout the city beyond the languages currently provided by the Voting Rights Act. Democracy NYC and Moya have worked closely with our government partners on this project, including the Campaign Finance Board, with whom we regularly collaborate on voter registration and voter access initiatives. We are very pleased that the Civic Engagement Commission established pursuant to the Charter Revision Commission last year passed by an overwhelming majority of voters and we will work to expand to we will work with the CEC on expanding interpretation uh, expanding the interpretation program. The administration remains fully committed to language access for all limited English proficient voters and to bring the value of this bill to life. Voting in New York City has been far too hard for far too long. We look forward to partnering with the council, the board, and other partners to successfully implement much needed reform to vote to voting in our city. I appreciate the council's focus on this issue and which are critically important to the health of the democracy in our city and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rini, and thank you to Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm honored to be able to testify today about the work that Moya has done to further civic engagement in immigrant communities, particularly our work with our partners to expand access to voting among New Yorkers who have limited English proficiency. We are all stronger when all New Yorkers have the opportunity to engage with the city, to raise their voices, and to participate fully. As part of the city's commitment to ensuring that New Yorkers, including immigrant New Yorkers, can participate in the civic process, Moya engages in a variety of projects. For example, we have translated voter registration forms into 11 languages to supplement the registration forms already translated by the New York City Board of Elections. We've also translated Know Your Rights information from the Campaign Finance Board into additional languages and created and distributed multilingual materials about registering to vote and other civic engagement opportunities. My testimony today, however, will focus on one of our major initiatives in partnership with Rini and her team and many throughout the uh, administration and the council, increasing access to voting and the topic of today's hearing, a pilot project to expand language interpretation services at poll sites and to facilitate greater access among voters who have limited English proficiency. 
I look forward to sharing more details of the project and some of our learnings with you. In 2017, recognizing that language access can empower voters with LEP, Moya worked with the City Council to launch a pilot project to expand interpretation services at poll sites, starting with the tw November 2017 general election. The pilot is meant to supplement existing interpretation services already provided by the BOE as part of their obligation under federal law specifically the Voting Rights Act, which requires access to interpretation in Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, Bengali, and Hindi. Using census data, the city developed a neutral data-driven approach to identify additional languages for which there was a need for interpretation, but for which the BOE did not provide the service. The city also identified locations where voters with LEP who speak those languages vote. During this pilot, Moya limited selection of poll sites to two neighborhoods with the largest populations of eligible voters with LEP who speak the top two languages among eligible voters, specifically Russian and Haitian Creole. Accordingly, in November 2017 election, we placed 52 bilingual English Haitian Creole and English Russian interpreters outside 20 poll sites. The interpreters offered interpretation assistance to voters and upon request answered voter questions about the process, assisted voters in navigating their poll site, and interpreted between BOE poll workers and orally translated voter ballots. Moya used a vendor to recruit, screen, and hire interpreters and developed and conducted a four-hour training based on BOE's own training materials on the role of interpreters, the day-to-day -day operations, the voting process, and how to provide the services, the nonpartisan nature of the project, and the prohibition on electioneering. Due to objections from the BOE, the interpreters for the poll site project were placed outside of the polling locations. Nevertheless, throughout this work, we were able to serve approximately 500 voters with LEP on election day. For the November 2018 general election, building on our experience from the prior year, we expanded the project with additional resources from the administration. Moya analyzed the languages spoken by the greatest concentration of eligible voters with LEP by poll site and identified six additional languages for which we could provide assistance with additional interpretation. Moya then identified 101 poll sites with the highest concentration of eligible voters with LEP. Again, we used a vendor to recruit, screen, and hire interpreters, which were then trained. Due to renewed objections from the BOE, the interpreters were once again stationed outside of polling locations. Nevertheless, we were able to serve four times as many voters with LEP, with 198 interpreters so serving about 2,000 New Yorkers. Most recently, we continued this project for the February 2019 citywide special for public advocate. The special election was announced in January of 2019, giving the city only a short lead time to work with our vendor to hire and train the interpreters and to ensure an effective operation. Ultimately, we placed 98 interpreters at 48 sites covering four different languages, Russian, Haitian Creole, Yiddish, and Polish, and served approximately 350 voters with LEP. In addition, having identified visibility of our interpreters as a key obstacle to utilization of the services in the two prior elections, we're happy to say that our interpreters offered services from inside the poll site buildings for the very first time. In February of 2019, the BOE filed a lawsuit challenging the poll site project. The BOE also saw a preliminary injunction to prevent the project from placing interpreters inside poll site buildings during the special election. The preliminary injunction was denied, and as I noted, we went forward, but the lawsuit remains ongoing. Turning to our learnings and plans for the future, our focus from the beginning of this project has been to identify how we can address the language needs of voters with LEP most effectively. To that end, we've worked closely with our agency partners in the implementation of this pilot project, including the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, the Law Department, the Mayor's Office of Operations, and Democracy NYC. And we look we look toward the upcoming special election in May, where we will provide interpreters again at three poll sites in Council District 45, the primary in June and the general election in November, 
we remain committed to working to establish an effective, reliable program that expands access for voters who are LEP. Additional interpretation services are crucial for voters who have LEP. Data demonstrates that while the Voting Rights Act provides a necessary floor for the provision of interpreter, interpretation to voters for LEP, there were many eligible voters with LEP who are not served. This project has offered a service that voters want. We firmly believe in increasing access to civic participation and a meaningful exercise of voting rights for New Yorkers. Accordingly, it is incumbent upon us to evaluate the needs of our incredibly diverse, naturalized immigrant community and to work towards addressing ongoing barriers to access to our democratic process, including English proficiency. In November 2018, New York City voters overwhelmingly approved a proposal for the New York City Charter Revision Commission to establish a civic engagement commission whose mission includes institutionalizing this work to expand language access at poll sites. The commission is required to consult with MOYA in developing a methodology to select languages and poll sites. The charter lays out the neutral criteria that the commission can consider when developing this methodology and directs the commission to consider the local law 30 designated citywide languages in its analyses. The criteria to consider include relevant data from the most recent American Community Survey, from the U.S. Census Bureau, the locations of poll sites and boundaries of election districts, and voter turnout information. We are excited to be working with the Commission as they take the pilot project we've overseen for the past few years and shape it into a full-fledged program. We've laid a solid infrastructure for this program by creating a pool of trained interpreters and developing training and operational plans, all of which the Commission can build on. Through overseeing the poll site interpretation project, Moya has seen firsthand the increased barriers that voters with LEP face. As the city works to eliminate barriers for all voters through the work of Democracy NYC and the Civic Engagement Commission, the Poll Site Interpretation Project will be crucial in helping to address barriers for voters who are LEP. Moving to intro 1282, Moya is grateful for the collaboration we have had with the Council on Civic Engagement and Connecting Immigrants to Democracy. Intro 1282 is a declaration of the Council's commitment to the needs of voters with LEP, and we support the intent behind the bill. We agree that the CFB's Voter Assistance Advisory Committee holds great ex expertise on the issues of voter engagement and access to voting. We fully expect the Civic Engagement Commission to engage with the CFB and with the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee as the Commission works to fulfill its mandate to increase civic engagement in the city, including through the creation of Poll Site Interpretation Project. In addition, Moya is committed to working with the Commission and CFB to ensure that the methodology developed by the Commission, in line with neutral criteria I laid out above, fully serves the needs of New Yorkers with LEP. We look for forward to further discussion on this bill. Ensuring access to voting is crucial to the health of our democracy. I want to thank this committee again for holding this hearing on this important topic. I'm ha happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both of uh, you for uh, your testimony. Uh, let me begin with Bill 1282 uh, because from both of the testimonies, oh, by the way, let me just recognize we've been joined by Council Member Yeager. But I, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm happy to hear that you support the spirit of it, uh, but I'm, I'm a little baffled as to why not give full support of it since you agree in, it, in its goal, uh, intentionality, uh, we need it. Uh, it's, I, I'm just wondering why not give the full support right now uh, that my colleague right now uh, could use. So we can make sure that all the LEPs are receiving, as you stated, there are many, many uh, that were not served. Uh, so why not just get the full support right now? Sure, so I can start. Um, so again, I wanna reiterate how grateful we are and aligned we are in the work that the council has done to increase access to voting for limited English proficient New Yorkers, council member Traeger being the initial champion of this work. So thank you for that. Um, I think uh, 
a, a few things around the bill. As I said, we support the intent of it, of course, and, and um, obviously want to work with the council um, on further discussions around the bill itself. I think some of the learnings that we've had and obviously what we've seen from New Yorkers is the overwhelming support for our CEC to undertake this project. Obviously, the voter um, advisory committee is not an established entity that can undertake the project. It's a committee. It's just that. It's an advisory committee. We've worked closely with the CFB um, and hope to continue in that conversation as we seek to cement this work within the CEC and establish it. I think the other thing that we would note is um, some of our learnings, right, in the last two years indicate the importance of um, being able to develop a methodology that takes no a number of things into consideration. Local authority, we would say, would be one of those things, but there should be other uh, factors that are taken into consideration when establishing where the services should be and what the services should be. Well, it's my hope that uh, the discussion will continue and that these concerns uh, that you have, which sounds to be a few, uh, they could definitely work out and they could be progressive, they could perhaps even go in stages. Uh, I'll lead that to uh, the sponsor of the bill uh, to work it out. Uh, but I'm happy to hear that you, you support the intent of it and hopefully sooner rather than later uh, we could get to the finish line. Uh, we have elections coming up yes. uh, and very significant ones uh, indeed. Uh, in terms of uh, the mayor, I was happy to hear the mayor uh, had allocated $75 million um, for the increase of poll sites uh, for the early voting. Uh, how many sites are you calculating? Is that near 100 uh, that we will have? Yes. And how do we come out uh, with that number? Why, why 100, why not 150 sure. or, or 75? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, the state legislation sets out um, uh, 50,000 voters per poll site up to seven. Um, when we look at the 50,000 voters per poll site number, we also saw that recommended by several um, good government groups, uh, groups in the advocacy community, and we also looked at other cities around the country who do early voting, including Boston and Chicago, um, and looked at what we thought would um, make uh, early voting accessible to New Yorkers. So um, looking at that uh, guiding number of 50,000 voters per poll site gets us to the 100 poll sites. Do you, have you calculated how long it would take an average person to, uh, from beginning to end, uh, to go through the whole process if we have this 100 uh, poll sites? It depends. Um, early voting, uh, and of course. Yes, of course. And one of the things that um, is important to consider as we um, look at early voting is when people are going to vote. Um, for example, on weekends, on lunch hours, people will be voting more then than at other times. So the, the hours is, is another important part of the um, calculation. So looking at all of that, um, you know, we believe that there should be a reasonable, it should take a reasonable amount of time to vote. But in terms of the specifics, we would have to look at the, you know, actual numbers and the, the different locations of the poll sites and the hours to, to figure that out. I think that will be helpful. And have you had a discussion with, uh, the, with BOE regarding uh, this injunction, this infusion of $75 million? Um, we have uh, shared the information uh, with the board, um, and uh, I went to their meeting last week um, to share it, and um, the, the mayor has made that, uh, that clear, and so we look forward to partnering with the board. Have you had any feedback? Not at this time. None at all? No. Okay. Uh, did they share with you when they will get back to you? No. No? Okay. All right, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pass it now to the sponsor of the bill, uh, Council Member Traeger, and then uh, with, for the rest of my colleagues, we'll start with five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, for, uh, again, for your uh, leadership and support on this issue. I thank the Commissioner and the Chief Democracy Officer. Thank you for your support as well. Um, I just wanna note for the record that I actually don't see conflict or any type of uh, contention with regards to the Commission 
and, and the spirit of our bill, because we've been working on this for quite some time, and the commission says, uh, which we respect the will of the voters, says that it should establish a program. That program has not been set up yet. Uh, and we're kind of in the process of baking a full-fledged program, so I think there's opportunity for alignment uh, here. I want to just also note for the record, uh, for the public, to share what uh, what I observed and experienced uh, in, the, in the recent special election for public advocate when I visited a poll site in Coney Island, uh, PS 188, where the bilingual interpreters were uh, initially told, again, to stay outside in the cold. And this is after the BOE uh, lost its uh, you know, injunction suit, um, so they, were, they should have been housed inside. Uh, they were told to stay outside, uh, if, and if it was not for, the, for their superiors and the, in, the, uh, in the administration, they were allowed to go, come back inside into the lobby. But they lost precious time in the morning after the initial confusion about whether to be outside or inside. But I want to just note for the record what kind of questions they fielded from immigrant voters. There were some questions that we heard about, you know, someone said, I am a Democrat. Am I allowed to vote today? That's a fair question to ask on a, during a special election because all voters are allowed to vote in a special election. And they were not sure. They also were not sure if they were in the right place because in years past there have been many changes to their poll sites. And so they're able to take out their street finder and make sure that they were in the right place. So questions that were very predictable were asked on that day. And if we're not for these, these, critical, uh, these critical services, these language access interpreters, we would have lost those votes. And turnout as, as it was in a special election is not always that great, but it makes it even that much more, uh, I think, important to increase turnout to the extent that we can and to help, and to help people. So I, I want to share that experience where I actually saw the promise of that program assisting our immigrant communities. I saw that firsthand. But I also heard stories where in, in some poll sites, the interpreters were told to go to like a second or third floor classroom of a school where no one could find them. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. And the Board of Elections now wants to engage in a debate about what does inside of a poll site mean. That's, that's, this is unreal to me. In the year 2019, we're having a debate about vocabulary over what electioneering is and isn't. Language access is not electioneering. And housing interpreters in poll sites does not mean putting them in the third floor classroom away from the voting site. This is, this is lunacy to me. Uh, but I just want to kind of get some questions uh, uh, on the record to the administration. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Why do you believe the Board of Elections sued the city uh, to block the language access pr program at poll sites? Um, you know, I won't uh, speculate as to the intention of the board. I think um, we've made our position clear. We believe strongly that this is an important initiative to increase meaningful access to voting and democracy. The voters overwhelmingly agreed in the last election cycle. Um, we remain uh, in having kind of channels of communication open with the board to ensure that we're being responsive to any concerns or challenges that they might express. We do not believe that there is a barrier to our ability to have our interpreters inside the polling and that litigation poll sites, and that remains ongoing, that litigation. And, and what can you say about the current litigation, where it stands and where, and where you see it going? Um, all I can indicate is, as you rightly noted, uh, the preliminary injunction was denied. We were um, per permitted to proceed in placing interpreters inside the polling buildings. Um, we will uh, proceed as such um, in the upcoming May special election. Um, and the uh, broader kind of issues um, that the board has brought remain ongoing as a part of the litigation. Right. And Forgive me for asking this question, but what is the administration's definition of inside the polling place means? 
does the Board of Elections apparently need some assistance on, on this question? Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak to sort of our experience in the um, prior elections where we were outside. Um, we, we markedly noticed a difference across poll locations where we were less visible, um, we were um, uh, at providing assistance at locations where residents who were voting actually lived in the polling location, seniors, and so had no visibility or knowledge of our presence to provide the service. Um, we had challenging weather, severe weather conditions for very long days, um, resulting in the need to be accommodating to obviously the workers and acknowledge how difficult the, the situations were. So our, our learnings were, have been clear in the necessity to not only provide the service, but to do so in such a way where you're visible, um, accessible, and the accommodations for the workers are um, ones that are are uh, respectful and dignified as well. So um, really that is the, the, the goal. And I think um, sort of working out what that looks like will obviously be a part of ongoing conversation and is a part of the litigation. But would you agree with me that if the voting poll site is inside of a school cafeteria, placing the interpreters in a third floor classroom is not really access? I would say our fundamental goal is to be as visible and as easily as accessible as possible. Which means inside the poll site. Um, are you aware of any legal barriers why they cannot be inside the poll site? Um, we're not a ver aware of barriers that would prohibit us from from being in the polling location. And I would say, you know, the, the law acknowledges that people might need to bring um, interpreters with them into a polling location, and it allows for voters to make that determination even independently. Right. Um, so I think it's important for New Yorkers broadly to know that you have the right to bring somebody with you into your poll site to provide voter assist, uh, voter interpretation assistance, um, and what we are seeking to do um, is is no no different, rather expanding that service. Right, and the reason why I think there really is no legal issue here is because the the interpreters that are mandated by federal law, which the Board of Elections seems to comply with or wants to comply with, are housed inside the poll sites. By placing the additional interpreters in a completely different location that's far from voters, to me, is creating a separate and unequal system. And I also want to note for the record that the Board of Elections might testify later on to, to, to complain about communication breakdowns or might complain about, you know, that this is, a, uh, this is not their program, this is a city program. The Board of Elections was offered the opportunity from the beginning of our efforts to develop its own program funded by the City of New York. And we've been going in circles because they keep moving the goalposts. It was a funding issue, then we paid for it. Then it became, well, the state didn't tell us we have to do this. But the law doesn't say you can't do it. So I don't think there's any legal barrier from having this language access program and from housing them inside the poll site accessible to voters. A um, cu couple last questions. Um, how would you characterize the communication between the city administration and the Board of Elections over the implementation of this program so far? I'll start and then I ask Rini to um, jump in. So, um, you know, I think as you rightly noted, we, we have engaged the board at the sort of inception thinking of wanting to expand language services. I think we are open and sort of welcoming um, as much communication um, as, the, as they would like um, in, in ensuring that we're aligned, that there's clarity, that everybody is on the same page. Um, we have tried to uh, ensure that we're keeping them up to date on um, our goals and intentions. Um, and I would say even on day of sort of challenges, we have regular communication if anything arises, we ask that they let us know if there are any issues to address um, and have been able to work collegially to address things. I, I will echo um, what uh, Vita said and, 
you know, from the beginning of um, our office's involvement in this, um, even before the date of the February special election was set, uh, we were in touch with the board regarding um, our intention to move forward um, with the interpreters. Um, and throughout the planning process, um, the board, once the sites are set for a special election, for an election, as you, as you all are aware, that takes time. Once the sites are set, that's provided to us. And then once we know where we're going to be providing interpreters, we send that back to them. And then day of, exactly with the issues you identified, um, we're able to be back and forth um, to make sure we're uh, dealing with any issues that arise um, efficiently. To be clear, you supplied the Board of Elections with that information as far as uh, what, what kind of information did they ask of you? Uh, that's, that's, did they ask any questions uh, prior to implementation of the program, or you just volunteered that, that information over to them? We provided them with a list of where our um, interpreters would be. And uh, when was that? As far as special election public advocate, how, how, how soon before? Or? I can't recall exactly, but we, you know, the special elections are challenging yes. um, because of the timeline, and they... Um, Set, select the sites, and then um, as quickly as possible after that, we provided them with the with list. I, I can get back to you with this specific. Sorry, I would add two things, which is to say we have told them in a well, well, kind of further in advance of the intention to do the work. Right. Um, the sort of narrowing where we will be has been um, kind of dictated in part by when they when they do the poll site selection. So once they've done that selection and we've been able to receive it and do our analysis and overlay our methodology, then we've communicated with them where our intention is to be. So it has been a back and forth. Both Rini and myself have been before the board um, it, it, formally in their meetings to talk about this work. Um, and again, have welcomed ongoing communication and questions. On a scale of one to ten, ten being the most cooperative, one being the least, how would you how would you rate the Board of Elections' cooperation with you on this effort? I mean, I would simply note, of course, that they sued us to stop the effort um, and and potentially leave it at that. Take it as a one or a zero, <laughs> um, and that that really speaks volumes to us. It really speaks volumes to us because there is no excuse other than a lack of just will and an intentional effort, in my view, to suppress votes in New York City. Because it's not an unfunded mandate. I am a big supporter of early voting, but New York State basically passed the law without adding money in the budget to New York City. So the city is picking up the tab, yep. but rightfully so, as we should. And in this case of language access programs, this is not an unfunded mandate. City of New York is putting its money where its mouth is. And they still refuse to cooperate with us on this issue. It's unacceptable. The last question I have is, how much money has been spent so far uh, in this last year pro program? Do you have data on that and how much uh, has sure. not been spent? I could speak to what's been allocated right. for the year, given that we're going to do an election in May as well as the June right. primary. So we've allocated um, $940,000 for this fiscal year, fiscal 19. Okay. All right. I, I look forward to continue working with the administration to finally see this become a reality once and for all in a permanent setting. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. And uh, we're going to put the clock at five minutes uh, because we had the BOE right after this uh, panel. So we'll start with Council. We'll continue with Council Mayor Powers, followed Thank by Council Mayor Yeager. Yes, I tried to use less than five minutes, but I can't promise anything. Uh, I just wanted to get a better understanding of the, both the announcement that the mayor just made about early voting relative to what's required under state law. So the, as I understand it, the statutory requirement of state law is that every county has to have, can have no more than, does not require to have more than seven locations. Is that correct? That's correct. And in this case, New York City sometimes is counted as one county under, or one sort of entity as state law as this is every borough in this case would, so 35 would be this the maximum required or would the minimum required exactly and and the way the the confusion is um it's it's a floor and a ceiling you know right, right. but uh the, i would say except for richmond county which has a, a lower population six would be the minimum required right, because of the population yes so that's it look got it and the mayor's announcement is to uh put in 75 million dollars to then get us to 100 sites so that beyond the 35 that are, are that are the sort of minimum whatever the requirement of the right. law that the the city would then have a, would have a hundred is that correct um, I would say 
um, at least 100. As, uh, you know. Okay, at least 100. And, and, and is that determined by how many in each borough? Is there a, is, was there a decision made about how that would be geographically spread? I think that, um, you know, approximately based upon the 50,000, or if you think about it, two per um, council district is another way to think about it. Okay. Um, and the, but then there are obviously there are high pop, like my district's a high population, transit centers like Grand Central in it, uh, the workforce in New York City and Midtown. So is it, is it, is it, is one, is the idea here that you might have some in, some really high volume area, you want more in some high volume areas that are transit rich and higher population centers? I think the idea is that we would want to, um, that, that the early voting sites should be responsive to the needs of the voting public. And so looking at transit, looking at hours, um, all of those are important factors to take into consideration. And I, it does not matter where I vote, where I live to go to what center I vote in, is that correct? The state law um, provides for countywide voting. Um, so within the county, if, if someone lives um, in Washington Heights, they could vote at Grand Central. Um, however, there is an exception in the state law if that is deemed impractical. Um, uh, we would urge uh, the Board of Elections to provide for countywide voting. Okay, so if I live in Brooklyn, I can't vote in Manhattan. Is that that's right? not provided for in the state law? Okay, and so um, you have put, uh, and where did the, how did the number seventy five million dollars become the number to fund a hundred site, hundred or more locations? That was based upon um, looking at previous staffing levels, rent, security. Um, obviously, looking at nine days of voting is different than looking at a single day. Um, so, kind of uh, providing for. Um, what that could look like. That's where the 75 came from. Okay. And I know the Board of Elections, I've actually worked with them on this, has a difficulty actually finding locations for sites. And, and in fact, has had to have relocate sites in my district. And it's had difficulty because of but to not finding willing partners to be able to host sites. And, and even even the, the difficulty around one day of having to bring the equipment in the day before has led to challenges. I've talked to the libraries and cultural institutions and community centers in my district, and it's been increasingly difficult to find ones that are willing to do it for one day. I'm will, I, just any, can you tell us about any work that's being done to try to encourage um, uh, places to serve as regular polling sites, but certainly a nine-day commitment, maybe 10 days if you have to bring the equipment in, um, adds a challenge to them that I re I've recognized from the existing difficulties. And, and so to find 100 that are willing to take 10 days seems like a task that's going to be difficult. I'm wondering what efforts are being done to locate and incentivize places to serve as early voting sites. Yeah, thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, that's something that the administration has worked on, uh, with the board on um, pre uh, previously um, around locating poll sites um, for the special election. I know I appreciate that's a challenge. We know that's a challenge. And we are engaged actively um, with our agencies that are currently um, poll sites to figure out exactly what that could look like. So we are um, open to working together to figure that out. And we have already engaged our agencies, and they know that we are um, eager to to make this work um, as, as well as possible. OK, just like one or two final questions here. You, you, have, you have the city as Al, the mayor, has allocated $75 million to the board. Tomorrow, the board will announce where those locations are. Is that correct? The, uh, by tomorrow, but any time. It could be, it could be yeah, now. Anytime. Maybe, yeah. maybe they're going to tell us now. <laughs> I've, I've seen their testimony. They're not telling us. <laughs> uh, but they... Uh, but they, um, but they're going to come out. My, my, my only point is, and I just want to be fair here. I agree with the mayor that more access points and more, and the money put in is a great positive step. The only, um, I, I actually have seen the difficulty of finding places. I've actually called myself through the list with the board of elections to find places and to push them, and some are really unwilling to do it. And that the, um, if you're going to put the money in, you got to be part of the process of helping identify them. And because they are going to find themselves probably tomorrow beyond, maybe not getting to 100 because of difficulties with this. And I hope they are. I hope they're going to have good news for us. But, um, but there is actually a logistical challenge here that we need to tackle. I'm happy to be part of it in my district in any way. But, the, um, but there is a real difficulty. And it, it can create an impossible, not an impossible, but a, an expectation that's um, at tension with the actual reality of finding. We are an eager and... Uh eager partner in that. Um, 
you know, and previously my staff has gone to poll sites with the board staff um, to, to work out what it needs to look like. So I think that's something that um, the administration will engage in to make sure we are able to get the sites that are needed. Okay, thank you for that. And, and so I, I brought up this issue, I discussed this issue before with uh, Director Ryan at a previous hearing as well. I think the fundamental problem that we have is the dismal amount of funding that is given, uh, especially to nonprofits, $250 for the day. I mean, it, that, that's just not an incentive. We should be giving them at least $1,000 a day uh, to be able to incentivize places. For example, houses of worship during the day. A lot of them are, are not being used during the day. But to be honest with you, they got to they gotta have somebody there all day long to man the place, clean the bathrooms, uh, and $250 for a lot of the places, you know, regardless of, of what nonprofit or any other uh, venue, it's just not an incentive enough. And I think that's very little money that will solve a big, huge problem uh, that we have. So if we could put that into consideration uh, in those $75 million, uh, I think it will go a long ways. And with that, let me pass it to uh, to Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, in November, the voters of New York uh, created the Civic Engagement Commission uh, with the uh, supposed goal of enhancing civic participation, promoting civic trust, strengthening democracy. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. Okay. Um, the bill that we're discussing today, Introduction 1282, would uh, create a, an interpretive program similar to what you're currently running out of the mayor's office and put it uh, under the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Is that the place that is best uh, designed to handle such a program? Thank you, Council Member, for the question. I think as I reiter reiterated earlier, uh, you know, our we, we believe that it's important that the CEC and on my office and, and Rini's team continue to consult with the CFB, to continue to consult with the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. But as indicated by um, the uh, charter revision and passed by the voters overwhelmingly, really the, the goal here is to establish and codify and, codify and institutionalize the program under the CEC. Um, and we believe that that makes sense, but cr certainly want to work with uh, partners to make sure we're identifying the right um, uh, program we're taking into consideration all of the the important feedback and understanding um, that the commission should have as it establishes that program. Our intention has already been and we are already engaging with um, the newly appointed CEC chair on the initiative um, to make sure that they're ready to fully take it over as we continue to support and advise. Does the CFB currently do any work at poll sites? Um, I can speak for how we've worked with the CF CFB to the, to the on the best this of your issue. knowledge, it's yes or no. To the best of your knowledge, does the CFB currently do work at poll sites on election days? To the best of my knowledge, no. That's also my understanding. Okay. So we'd be creating a new program, giving it to an agency that uh, is does not have in its mission to do this, where we currently have a commission created uh, that does have in its mission to do this, um, and yet we're basically inventing something to ask the CFB to run a program at poll sites, as your understanding of the bill. I can't speak um, directly for the full intention. Um, as I said, this is an area for I, us, I, of course. I'm, I'm not asking about the intention. I'm asking about your understanding of the, of the bill. It, um, it, it's very clear that it puts this program into the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, it says the committee shall provide. The committee is not the commission. Yeah, and committee. as I previously noted, that's an area where we would seek to have further discussions around the bill and certainly would... So the bill's not ready yet? Uh, we, we have uh, concerns that I raised today that we look forward to continued conversations Let me around. pick up on something else that uh, has, has been asked, um, but perhaps not addressed uh, from your table, but it's been asked here in this room today. Do you believe... Uh, and would you characterize uh, the Board of Election as engaged in an illegal effort to suppress votes in the city of New York? All that I can phrase was used here today. Do you believe that the Board of Elections engages in an effort to illegally suppress votes in the city? 
All I can speak to is what we believe um, is not a barrier, which is is that it's not a barrier for us to want to increase and to increase voter interpretation at polling locations. Right. But we all, but we, we all, Commissioner, we all, we, we all want to do that. We all want to create uh, uh, favorable experiences. We all support the interpreter program. I support it. Um, I think everybody at this table supports it. Um, most of the members of the council, I believe, support it. The question that I'm asking is whether or not you believe it's a yes or no, whether or not you believe that the Board of Elections is engaged in an illegal effort to suppress votes. I think it's an important question because um, you are the commissioner of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. You're the chief democracy officer of the city of New York. In this room today, a statement was made that the Board of Elections engages in an illegal effort to suppress votes. I'd like to know if the position of the administration is that the Board of Elections of the city of New York engages in an illegal effort to suppress votes. I can't speak to the legality of something that's being speculated without looking at it and obviously consulting with our lawyers. We believe uh, the city's interpretation program is legal. Um, the board has sued us. Uh, they have a different opinion. Um, we're in front of a judge right now on that question. Okay. Do you believe that the city of New York, you're a lawyer, do you believe that the Board of Elections is engaged in an illegal effort to suppress votes? You can take out the word illegal if you want. Do you believe that the Board of Elections is trying to suppress votes in the city of New York? Again, I think our mission is to um, increase voter accessibility, um, increase voter participation, and the efforts that we have undertaken are to, to do that. And the Board obviously disagrees uh, with some of those. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Traeger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to just briefly remind the public of, how, of why we got here in the first place. Because I witnessed something illegal in a poll site many years ago prior to being in office. I witnessed a poll worker who was both a Holocaust survivor and a World War II veteran having the audacity to get up and to assist a senior citizen to find out if she was in the right place or not. because She spoke Russian, but no one there spoke Russian in the poll site. And the coordinator said, I'm having the police reprimand you, potentially arrest you for speaking an unauthorized language inside of the poll site. And this person was mortified. That is illegal. No voter, no person should be intimidated or chilled in, in the United States of America, in a poll site in New York City, for simply asking, am I in the right place in their, in their language? No one. That's how we got here in the first place. And I've also heard from poll workers and coordinators who have attended trainings conducted by the Board of Elections that they are enforcing some sort of rule that you could only speak authorized languages inside of the poll site. Of course, they won't produce that in writing because they know that is blatantly illegal. But that has been repeated to me by a number of folks in a variety of assembly districts. That's how we got here. There is nothing against the law to add additional language services inside of poll sites. The only barrier that's been put up is one by the Board of Elections. It's an artificial barrier. It's a political barrier. So yes, there have been illegal efforts to suppress voters in New York City, a city made up of immigrants, strengthened by immigrants. And we all keep hearing the phrase, every vote counts. It's time to put actions behind those words. This, this needs to be an applied practice not just a slogan. And I thank the chair again for his time. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, just three more minutes, and then we'll have BOE, but I have uh, some uh, cleanup questions here. Can you address uh, what would be the, what is or will be the methodology for selecting LEPs that get interpreters? So I, I can talk sort of broadly about this, and if you're interested, 
can get into the nerdy data t with our data statisticians on how we land where okay. we do. But um, you know, broadly, what we've looked at is, as I noted, uh, how to how to have an approach that's data driven and that's neutral that the city can rely on in in selecting both the languages and the locations that we provide the service. Um, that's relied primarily on census data. That's not unlike what the BOE itself does in in looking at its obligations under the Voting Rights Act. Um, and for us, the kind of goal has been looking at polling locations where you have the highest concentration of limited English proficient eligible voters so that we're effectively deploying the resources that we have for the maximum number of potential uh, voters. And let me ask you one last question. You know, the charter also requires the commission to put forth rules in consultation with Moya regarding uh, related to minimum standards and training requirements for poll science interpreters. Can you describe what would be included in these rules? How would these rules align with existing NYC BOE rules and the Voting Rights Act related to the poll science language assistant? And what safeguards would the administration employ to prevent electioneering by interpreters or the appearance of electioneering? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So a big goal of ours has been, honestly, consistency with what the BOE is doing with its interpreters, ensuring that um, the interpreters go through a robust training um, that identifies for them um, what the voting process looks like, of course, what the operations are, but also indicates what they are and what they are not per permitted to do. So um, by way of example, they're clearly prohibited, and this is a big part of the training, from doing any electioneering. Um, they're, they're obligated to assist in answering questions, um, to assist folks in navigating uh, their polling location, um, to ensure that they have the support and in interpretation between a poll worker and uh, the voter, um, and to just strictly translate the ballot um, as, it, as it appears. Um, you know, for many of us who are voters, obviously reading a referendum question or something can be complicated um, and technical. And so having the assistance of somebody who can translate that directly into your language is hugely helpful and meaningful in going through the process. Um, we have, as I said, emphasized all of these points within the training. Um, we've indicated that somebody would be will be immediately dismissed if they are in violation of any of those. Well, how would somebody know? If somebody's interpreting sure. a language in Spanish and there's nobody else around who speaks Spanish, I guess that's the fundamental fear that some people have. How do you address that? Yeah, and I think a couple of things. One, our structure has um, put into place a number of sort of layers of supervision, so both on the ground and then available to be responsive. Um, we have obviously notified the BOE that that's what they're there to do in terms of providing the service. Um, and as I said, indicated to the worker that should we, we learn any differently, then of course they would be immediately dismissed. The signs that the interpreters have simply say interpretation, right? That is what they're there to do and to provide. Um, and our hope is that, uh, you know, the, the experience of the vo voters is just that. I will say we've now run this program for three elections. We've neither heard an allegation of electioneering That's happening, great. nor heard anything negative about the experience of interpreters in the process, um, and recognize that this is an issue that exists across the board, even with the, the BOE's own sort of structure of interpretation. And so I think we have to fundamentally believe um, in doing proper training, proper supervision, pro proper accountability, and ensuring that we're doing that effectively, and that'll be a part of what we will promulgate. So you have a 100% track record for the last three years. That's very happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both, and I want to congratulate you ahead of time, and, uh, and I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you. And with that, um, Thank you. We're going to invite now the NYC BOE, um, Michael, Director Michael Ryan, and Don Shadow, also from the Borough of Elections.
Director, we're ready whenever you are. I know you've been waiting anxiously. Yes, uh, sorry about that. I know you couldn't wait to be here today, and you're very excited. This is the thickest stack. Get a big, thick stack of this. Were you ready to be sworn in? <clears throat> yes, I am. Okay. If you could both raise your hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. You may begin. Yes. Uh, good morning, Chair uh, Cabrera. Uh, if you could turn the mic on, please. Sorry. Thank you. Sir. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the New York City's Council uh, Committee on Governmental Operations. Uh, I am Michael Ryan. I am the Executive Director of the Board of Elections in the City of New York, and seated next to me, uh, to my left, is uh, the Deputy Executive Director, Dawn Sandow. Also uh, present here today are Administrative Manager, Pamela Perkins, Operations Manager Georgia Consumanis, General Counsel Stephen Richmond, uh, Deputy General Counsel Rafael Savino, and uh, Valerie Vasquez, our Director of Communications. Uh, I have submitted detailed uh, testimony, uh, but if it's okay with the uh, members of the committee, I'm prepared to uh, give an overview of that testimony and not uh, read it line by line, uh, and then we can get to the question and answer period of this uh, exercise, which is always uh, the most lively portion of the program in any event. We appreciate that. Yes, uh, the first four months of 2019 has seen uh, sweeping and dramatic changes uh, in the New York's uh, election system. As I sit here today, I would like to point out uh, that the early voting process, shall we say, in New York is only in existence since January 24th, 2019. Uh, next to me in a box is binders from multiple jurisdictions throughout the country where we've already done uh, research uh, to determine how early voting is conducted uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, I'll note from earlier testimony that uh, Chicago was a city that was mentioned uh, as, as an example. Uh, we have dispatched staff to Chicago to watch their early voting process uh, be conducted uh, in February. Uh, we were advised by Chicago uh, that they get the most uh, bang for the buck, if you will, out of uh, no excuse absentee. Uh, which, uh, which is essentially a vote-by-mail system uh, in Chicago, which is the largest numbers of their early voting process. Uh, that is not something that is presently possible under the New York State Constitution, uh, but at some point down the road, uh, it may be another option uh, available for voters. And, and if it uh, comes that way, we will certainly um, have no uh, qualms in implementing such a program. Uh, in any event, on January 24th, there were four bills that were signed into law, uh, consolidating the September and June primaries. That was a welcome change uh, to the board moving forward, although it did provide some logistical and operational challenges uh, in the early part of uh, 2019. Early voting, uh, pre-registration of 16 and 17-year-olds, which is a relatively uh, easy implementation for us since we already pre-registered 17s. So it's just uh, a matter of adding the 16-year-olds to that. Uh, and then uh, the statewide uh, voter registration and enrollment transfer, uh, which is uh, really a, more or less a behind-the-scenes uh, aspect of the changes, but certainly uh, one that presents its own set of logistical uh, challenges. Uh, in order to provide some significant context on where we are presently, I would like to point out that at the time that early voting was established on January 24th, the infrastructure to conduct early voting in New York City or in New York State for that matter did not exist. Uh, it is in the process of coming into existence, but we are at the very early stages of this process. So if, if we were to 
hit the rewind button and go back to January 23rd, 2019, before any other changes happened, the way that you would conduct the early voting is on paper poll books and having double the amount of paper ballots available at early voting sites uh, throughout uh, the state. Uh, we are in the process of evolving. Uh, in the budget uh, bill, there was money made available uh, for electronic poll books, which are going to be an essential element of one of the tasks that the New York State Board of Elections has been required to uh, ensure against, which is making sure that somebody doesn't vote early and vote on Election Day. And that ability to communicate uh, with technology uh, back and forth between the poll sites uh, and, and the overall uh, voter rolls is an essential element to make sure that that manipulation of the system does not occur. Uh, in addition, uh, we expect that we will be able to use a ballot on demand system to deliver uh, ballots at the early voting sites. The reason that I say that we expect uh, to be able to use ballot on demand, a ballot on demand system is presently the New York State law does not comport with the use of ballot on demand systems in all elections. Uh, for example, under 7 106 of the New York State election law, uh, ballots are not only required to have stubs, and in the case of a single page ballot, we could buy pre perforated stubbed paper and reduce. Uh, the amount of space available for candidates and meet that requirement. The requirement that we cannot meet, and no ballot on demand vendor can do this, uh, is if we were to go to a two-page ballot requiring a center perforation and have another one of those 38-inch ballots like we had uh, in November, no ballot on demand system meets that requirement. So what did we do when we first heard about early voting? Uh, we immediately contacted uh, the State Board of Elections and said, folks, is the ballot that we're going to deliver on a, uh, at an early voting site the equivalent of an absentee ballot or is it the equivalent of an Election Day ballot? The legislation ultimately clarified that and it is the equivalent of an Election Day ballot. And the reason that that question was asked was to pose this question vis-a-vis -vis ballot on demand. And so we were told it's an Election Day ballot. So we're still in the present moment at the stub perforation requirement at a minimum for a one-page ballot and potentially at a center perforated stub uh, for a two-page ballot. Uh, so what's the good news? The good news is uh, we hear that the New York State Legislature is working closely uh, with the State Board of Elections and we've had our feedback with the State Board of Elections and the expectation is that the stub requirement and the center perforation requirement is going to be retired uh, as an anachronistic leftover uh, from the way that we used to vote. Um, it hasn't happened yet, uh, but based on those assurances, we are moving forward with looking at uh, ballot on demand uh, systems in conjunction with um, in conjunction with electronic poll books. The other little wrinkle with the electronic poll books, however, is under the state law, the uh, New York State election, uh, Board of Elections must authorize the vendors that you can use for electronic poll books. Now, our understanding is it stops about a dime short of a full-blown certification, but it still requires an authorization. And it's our understanding uh, that that authorization is going to come sometime in June. Um, and that the state OGS contract, which will allow for the procurement of uh, electronic poll books, will come sometime in July. Given the number of poll workers that we must train in advance of a, a November uh, general election, which is now shortened uh, until October the 26th. So it's really no, no longer a November election. It's, a, it's an October election now in New York State. Uh, we must engage in that training commencing in July. Uh, so either of those two scenarios is too late uh, for the City Board of Elections uh, to, uh, to choose a vendor and to procure a vendor. 
right? And then to train our poll workers. So we had discussions with the State Board of Elections, and the State Board of Elections uh, it has given us assurances that if we uh, put language in our procurement that says if they're not, if the vendor is ultimately not uh, approved by the State Board of Elections, then we have the ability uh, to get out of the contract. Uh, our agency chief contracting officer has coordinated within the city PPB rules, numerous uh, demonstrations at the board offices for staff uh, to take a look at these, uh, to take a look at these systems. Um, several of the vendors combined the uh, ballot on demand with the electronic poll books. Uh, there was one vendor uh, that you'd have to make a separate procurement. Uh, but in any event, um, we've taken a, a look at these systems. We have a pretty good uh, idea of what they can do, and we will be presenting uh, our findings to the commissioners in the coming weeks so that we can go about the business of procuring uh, the electronic poll books uh, and the ballot on uh, demand systems. Uh, our ACO has also made a determination as to those vendors that we could piggyback off of a contract from another jurisdiction. Uh, and and somewhat uh, condense uh, the procurement time uh, as opposed to a full-blown RFP process, which would not uh, be something that we could engage in uh, and expect to make any of these deadlines. Uh, so to do a pick and pull, you know, uh, paper ballot uh, system at the early voting sites with stockpiles of paper ballots was absolutely unworkable. Uh, so we looked uh, for other options. Um, at the direction of the Board of, com uh, of Commissioners, uh, a letter was sent uh, to the State Board uh, to make an, in an inquiry under 7-201 subdivision 4 of the New York State election law, which would permit the use of a system, uh, uncertified voting system, on an experimental basis. Uh, and had the State Board uh, granted that approval, uh, the City Board could have potentially used an, a, a system uh, for the purposes of uh, marking and or tabulating uh, the ballots in, in, in a different way. Um, under those circumstances, and in that limited window that this request was made, the only way that the law would provide for use of such a system is on a borrow or rent basis. It would not be a procurement. And that is a significant uh, point to make because that is not the way that this has been portrayed by some uh, in, in the public conversation of this. So uh, the city uh, commissioners directed that that letter be sent. It was sent. Um, we ultimately received a response back uh, from the State Board of Elections on April 19th, uh, indicating uh, that um, they were not comfortable uh, in moving forward in that regard. So we have turned the page and we're moving forward with uh, the ballot on demand system. So that is one option that we were exploring, uh, that we were looking uh, potentially to do, and it was uh, uh, not approved by the State Board of Elections, as is their uh, right and authority to do so, and we're not quarreling uh, with that uh, at all. Uh, the reason that we didn't make a similar request of another vendor, uh, and please be reminded that there are only two election system tabulators in New York State, the reason that such a request was not made from, for the other vendor is their most recent system is already certified uh, by New York State. Therefore, uh, no such request for experimental use was required under the law. Uh, in our uh, zeal to look f for all options, we sat here, not here, but uh, virtually here uh, uh, in November, uh, and we went back and forth for three and a half hours. And one of the overriding frustrations that we heard from the city council, which we took back uh, and discussed with our commissioners, is we need to modernize uh, the way that we conduct voting in New York City. And we heard that. Uh, and we understood it. Uh, and then we went about the business of having uh, our, ourselves and our vendor conduct uh, a, uh, a review of what happened in November. And our vendor tells us 
Uh, and we're not experts in what the voting technology can do. Uh, vendors in this regard, whether it's the vendor that we presently use or any other vendor, have to serve a dual purpose role uh, in this process. One is they got to provide you with the equipment. Two is they have to serve as your techn technical consultant. They have to tell you what their system does and what it's capable of doing. So we got feedback from them that says that in a similar circumstance, with the amount of volume that we had, with the center perforated two-page ballot and ballot pages with perforations on both ends, that if we're in that situation again with the current voting system, we should expect that we will be in a very similar situation. Uh, and I believe that that information was shared uh, with the chair and the speaker uh, uh, through proper channels. Uh, so that kind of puts a little bit of a bow around uh, where we are uh, and, and what we were doing up to this point. Um, now let's turn to uh, the early voting sites themselves. The early voting sites themselves, uh, what the commissioners uh, directed be done is that all voting uh, locations by March the 15th in the city, so let me back up a second, it used to be May the 1st, uh, when we had to designate poll sites because of the movement of the uh, primary from September to June, uh, we now had to designate uh, by March the 15th. So we had about six weeks notice that six weeks of our designation time was going to be cut off uh, at the back end, while all at the same time conducting a citywide special election and now immersed in the petition process that just concluded last Thursday, or last Friday, uh, the petition process for the June primary. Oh, and by the way, there's another special election coming up on March the 14th in the 45th uh, council district. So we have all of that going on and we're planning for early uh, voting. So what we did was we designated all of the sites in the city that are presently uh, could be identified as potential sites for early voting. And we, and we, and all of our election day sites. So it's, it's over 1,200 sites. Uh, so we did that so that we have a penelope of sites, a menu, if you will, to pick from uh, in conjunction uh, with uh, working with uh, elected officials and the administration uh, with respect to this plan. So where are we today? Today, we have so far identified 37 sites uh, that we could use uh, as suitable locations uh, for early uh, voting. Where else are we today? This is a stack of letters that we have from sites that are now just starting to get a whiff of the fact that early voting is coming and that election day is no longer one day, but it's really 12 days, potentially. Election day, plus the nine days of early voting, which must run consecutively. We can't break it up. And then a day to deliver before early voting starts and a day to pick up the equipment after early voting starts. And these are the folks that are objecting to being poll sites, the likes of which we never see. We do a pro forma, it's a pro forma letter that goes out every year and everybody that's designated a poll site, every once in a while, somebody says they had an event or they rented out their space and they didn't realize the primary was gonna be on a certain day. But for general elections, we, we almost get no objection whatsoever. But now we get a, a stack and they're coming in on a daily basis. So I am heartened to hear uh, that uh, the administration uh, and, the, uh, and the council is willing to work with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, Councilman Powers has left the room because uh, he hit the nail really on the head. Anybody, uh, and actually, uh, uh, Councilman Yeager, we've worked on, on poll sites uh, as well, and we all know the challenges associated uh, with, with the poll sites uh, and finding them and having willing uh, partners. Uh, in this process. Uh, I've also, and it's not in my written testimony, but I've heard uh, some other um, suggestions that we should be thinking outside the box and looking at other uh, types of locations. For example, uh, you know, storefronts. You, you know, you have uh, some of these storefronts that are not uh, being utilized and you might be able to use them for early voting. 
one of the hurdles that we have confronted, and we've only had preliminary conversations with the law department and with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, is there presently is not a short-term procurement for that type of location. So it will require, and I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that it's insurmountable or that some legal minds can't get together and put some, uh, you know, put some pen to paper and amend uh, the leasing uh, process for New York City. But if we're going to go to private sites and we're going to ask them to be poll sites, right, presuming that we don't have the legal authority to designate them, but there's an empty place and it's convenient, we need to remedy the procurement process so that, uh, Chair Cabrera, your suggestion uh, to you know, sweeten the pot, if you will, to make it more financially attractive for some of these locations to do this, we must have a mechanism to pay them and a procurement mechanism that meets the PPB uh, rules in order to do that. Uh, so we have flagged uh, that issue uh, to the, uh, to the uh, law department and to uh, DCAS. Uh, the preliminary uh, word that we got back so far, keeping in mind that all of this is uh, you know, evolving, uh, that right now the rules don't exist in order to make that happen. Uh, so, uh, those are uh, some of the challenges uh, that we have associated with, not the least of which, as uh, Ms. Sandow just pointed out, that we do have always uh, the specter of fying, finding uh, sites that are accessible uh, within the definition set forth in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, so. Um, I've, I've hit some of the high points in terms of what we've done so far. We've dispatched uh, staff to, uh, to Chicago to observe early voting. Uh, we've uh, consulted uh, with numerous other early voting jurisdictions to get guidance and feedback, including Chicago, L.A., uh, Miami-Dade County, Harris, Harris County, Texas, which has been doing early voting since 1984. Uh, Miami-Dade doing it since, I believe, 2002. Um, our legal team is working together with the state legislature and the state board uh, to do uh, the work necessary for some of these cleanup bills. Uh, and I can shed a little bit more light uh, with respect to some of the uh, financial numbers uh, that have been put out uh, into the stream of commerce recently. Uh, our staff, uh, our finance staff, has worked very closely uh, with the Office of Management and Budget uh, to begin to round out what an early voting budget will look like, um, keeping in mind that a lot of it is is a bit of guesswork uh, presently uh, because it's still evolving. Uh, but it was important to stake out a number uh, so that uh, the city would not find itself and the board would not find itself caught short uh, because now the budget's been completed and we didn't have a, an appropriate placeholder and, and then we'll find ourselves in the middle of next year asking for a new need that will be hard to come by, as we all know, in the middle of a fiscal year if you're looking for a big number. Uh, so we've been researching and identifying uh, locations that will be suitable over... Um, uh, a nine to 11 day period, uh, and as well as evaluating the impact of conducting early voting on the NYPD and what our security needs will be 24 hours a day, seven days a week for an 11 day period with respect to securing uh, the voting machines. Uh, so uh, that's some of the challenges, uh, and we make that statement to temper expectations uh, as to what an early voting uh, experience is going to look like first coming out of the gate. Uh, and the reason that all of this material is here is to drive home the point that each one of those jurisdictions uh, to, a, to a jurisdiction cautioned against biting off uh, too much in the initial uh, phases of early voting implementation. Every one of them has told us, you want to make sure that the voters that use uh, early voting have a positive experience and that they develop an ever-increasing faith in that process and that the system will work. The worst thing that we could do is get overly ambitious and then not have it not work and then undermine uh, the, uh, the the voting public and the voter confidence. So.
Pardon? Phase it in. Uh, and, and so we, we, they, they have all uh, counseled on a phased in process. As a matter of fact, I remember one conversation with uh, Miami Dade where um, uh, the administrator said, well, I actually feel bad for you guys because when we started doing early voting, nobody was doing it. So nobody had any real expectations. Now that it's been happening in other jurisdictions and New York's a little bit late to the game, there's this, uh, you know, sense of, well, this should just, you know, be add water and stir, put a little something in the, and, and drink it, and it's all going to be uh, happy and magic, but it won't. It's going to be tough work, but I'm heartened to hear that uh, everybody's on board and trying to, to make it work. Um, we discussed uh, the OGS contract. We discussed the PPB rules. Um, I just uh, gave you the caution. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so uh, the following issues uh, that we must address uh, moving forward, which will continue. I know that uh, there was eagerness to have this hearing today. Uh, um, what that did for us a little bit was shift our, our, our focus. Uh, we were focused on having more of these answers ready for uh, May the 17th, which is our budget testimony day. And we were looking at that as the, that's the real date that we have to get everything done. And then this came up. Uh, so in any event, we, every jurisdiction has told us we need to establish a completely separate unit uh, for early voting. And we have been cautioned against mixing the apples with the oranges. And that the early voting folks should be the early voting folks and the election day folks uh, need to be the election day uh, folks. Because if you do it uh, the other way, we've been told it's going, to, it's going to become very messy very quickly. What that's going to do, though, is it's going to require us to uh, complete our analysis for new need staffing request. Uh, and it's going to also require us to have additional space uh, made available so that these people uh, can sit down in front of computers and work. Uh, right? And so um, there's staffing needs, uh, securing additional OSHA ADA compliant office space. Uh, evaluating and, st and establishing the infrastructure requirements uh, necessary for the early uh, voting program, both in the office and at uh, uh, the storage facility uh, where the machines are going to be stored. Uh, working with the law department to amend the, uh, the process uh, for the uh, non-governmental sites that we might uh, get feedback um, from and, and, and find that they're necessary uh, to be used. Uh, so. Uh, until the passage of the primary consolidation bill, the board was required to make poll site designations by May 1st, as, as I said. Now it's May 15th. All of the poll sites were designated as legally required on March 15th, including any sites to be used for early voting. On April 29th, yes, April 29th, yesterday, uh, the State Board of Elections approved early voting rules and regulations. Uh, we have not uh, received them officially yet. Uh, we have an understanding of what's going to be in them uh, once we have them, and we've had the opportunity to go over it with staff and our legal staff as well. Uh, <laughs> we will understand in more detail uh, the impact uh, that it will have on early voting. Uh, is there anything I left out? No? no? Okay. okay. All right. So uh, that concludes the early voting portion uh, of of the program, uh, and I will turn my attention to uh, the poll site translation services. Um, and, and, I, and I would like to say, I, I've, I've heard everything uh, that was said here today, uh, and, and I, I know I have said this before, um, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, fully uh, appreciated or believed, but I will say it again. There really is no daylight, uh, specifically Councilman Traeger, between uh, your position and the board's uh, position. The, the difference of opinion comes from who should be administering uh, the, uh, ultimately, who should be administrating the translation services and what's the criteria for choosing who gets services. One of the fears, uh, and, I, and, I, and I know it's not a fear that's widely shared, but it has to be a fear uh, that the uh, board takes seriously is if you offer outside the bounds of a legal structure a language service to a, a, a group that is not presently covered by either federal law or state law uh, without uh, 
any understanding of how that criteria is made, or even with an understanding of how that criteria is made. The Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution applies equally to people who are disenfranchised as they are to people who are enfranchised. So if we go ahead and offer services outside the bounds of that important structure, other groups are going to come and say, well, you gave it to them, how come you're not giving it to us? And at some point, there becomes a, and I don't know what that line is, but at some point, there is a, a line that you cannot go beyond, that you don't have uh, the unlimited resources. And our experience has been with the courts. Believe me, we have experience with the courts. Our experience has been with the courts. When a federal court issues an order, you better follow it. And it doesn't matter if you have the resources or you don't have the resources, you got to get the resources and you got to make it happen. And you have consent decrees and all of those other things. So what we're simply asking for is a structure, a legal structure some authority to tell us legally this is what you need to do. Where we have a difference of opinion with the city council, not only on this issue, but on many issues, is does the city council have the authority to, to, to give that authorization? And our consistent position, the commissioner's consistent position, is that it, the appropriate venue for this discussion to be had is in the New York State legislature. This is our Bible. It is the New York State election law. If you've read it, I feel bad for you because it's very confusing, but I read it all the time. Uh, so if a change to the New York State election law is made and placed into this book, we will do everything humanly possible to make sure that that happens. So for your uh, perusal and consideration, we have attached two bills, uh, Senate Bill 4036A, uh, presently pending, uh, introduced on February 26, 2019, uh, and Assembly Bill 6075, also introduced on February 26, 2019. Now, these are not same as bills, uh, so we can't sit here and say that there's an absolute uh, that they will pass. Um, but they are companion bills, and they are very similar. And interestingly enough, um, they specifically reference the City Board of Elections in, in, in the Senate bill and says that we should be guided by 23-1101 uh, of the Administrative Code. That provides clear direction that we can follow and then meet the needs of the other uh, as yet uncovered language uh, services. But what it also does, I think perhaps even, uh, you know, more significantly from a, from a practical standpoint, is if these two bills are consolidated uh, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the daylight is, is, is closed and the governor signs it into law, then we're going to be in the position of the state law preempting the city action uh, as, a, as a field occupying event. Uh, and, and so, to avoid that confusion, we would prefer uh, to wait until uh, the conclusion of the, of the state process and let that uh, happen. And if it becomes law, we will be mandated to, to cover the languages uh, pursuant to the uh, uh, city planning uh, as interpreted by 23-1101 of, uh, of the administrative code. Uh, and then, uh, under those circumstances, I would hope uh, that at least for a short period of time, uh, that uh, issue would be put to rest. Um, understanding that New York City is a migrant uh, uh, population, people move all over the place and they come in and go out. So I would suspect that at some point down the road, even if we resolve this, there will be another group uh, that comes in behind the groups that are here presently and, and, and want uh, answers to those uh, same questions. But as long as we have a beacon to follow, uh, which would be city planning, uh, as interpreted by the you know, uh, Administrative Code 23-1101, uh, signed into law by the governor, uh, then we're all on firm footing and we don't have to worry about being dragged into uh, federal court over the issue. Uh, 
that's uh, what I have to say on those issues, and uh, I, I certainly uh, welcome uh, any questions uh, that the panel may have. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Let me uh, recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Rodriguez, which they also will be having questions after Councilmember Traeger. Uh, but I have a few questions here. Uh, number one, uh, have you, I'm sure that you heard the testimony from Demo uh, Democracy NYC, uh, you receive uh, communications from the mayor's office regarding the $75 million. Uh, what's your present position regarding the $75 million uh, for poll size and early voting? So that number was initially presented to the commissioners uh, last Thursday uh, in between the petition hearings uh, that were going on all day from uh, 9.30 in the morning till after 5 o'clock at night. Uh, we then had petition hearings again on uh, Friday. Our next meeting, what time is it now? I don't, even, I don't have my watch, but our next meeting is at 1.30. So in an hour and a half, uh, that will be my first face-to-face uh, -face opportunity uh, to have a conversation uh, with the commissioners. Uh, but I, I will say this. The, the, the Board of Elections understands what an undertaking this is. We also understand uh, that this is not something uh, that the Board of Elections should or could uh, be expected to do on its own without assistance uh, from all uh, corners uh, of uh, the universe in New York City. Uh, the, uh, the citizens, various government entities, uh, making government facilities uh, available, and then at the end of it, staffing those early voting sites. And I, I want to also point out very, very clearly, we're not talking about an additional 11 days. We're not. We're talking about an additional 11 days per election event, including special elections. So we're talking about an additional 11 days for presidential primary in 2020, an additional 11 days for uh, the June primary next year. Oh, and by the way, there may be a special election depending on how things work out in one of the counties because a countywide official is running for another countywide office, which is going to lead us uh, potentially into a special election after the first of the year. So when we're talking about designating these poll sites as early voting sites. It's not asking them to do uh, an additional uh, 11 days. It's asking them to do an additional 11 days times every election event uh, that is happening in a year, which in some years could be 44 days but do, or 55 days. But do you recognize that, do you recognize that we need more than 35 sites? As I said, the board is committed to establishing a process, moving forward, coming with a base number of sites that everybody agrees on we can reasonably accomplish uh, by November, uh, but not expecting that that's going to be the last stop on the train. Okay, we did our job, let's move on. Right. This process must evolve as being cautioned by other jurisdictions that have vast uh, experience in this area and phase in over the course of time. Uh, and so, yes, we agree that we must do everything we can do collectively to make sure that the early voting process works uh, in, in New York uh, City. Uh, but by the same token, as I said earlier, we have to do it in a, re a reasonable and measured way uh, to make sure that it works the first going out of the box and provides a solid foundation that cannot be undermined upon which we can build to establish a, 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 an early voting process that is worthy of the greatness of the city of New York. I, I'm, I'm glad that you look at uh, other, other states, municipalities, based on your analysis, I'm sure you completed that analysis, uh, how many poll size do you normally need per however many people, 100,000 people, 50,000 people? Well, typically we, uh, we deploy uh, one scanner presently for every 1,400 voters. So that analysis doesn't really work for us. And other jurisdictions have told us 
that the early voting process is going to evolve. You'll see it low in the, in, in the initial rollout, and it will build over the course of time. But the only way it's going to build over the course of time is if we do it right, and we, and we, have co and we establish confidence that it can work. The other thing that I thought was interesting from most of the jurors, but what I don't want is people going and waiting and waiting and waiting, and it's an a, and then ends up being a bad experience. I'm also making an assumption, and I recognize assumption is the lowest form of knowledge, but I'm making an assumption here that you're going to have more than usual uh, amount of people, constituents going out to, to, to experiment and to try this early voting. And the reason why is because we had the presidential uh, race coming up, the primary. The turnout, I believe, is going to be unprecedented uh, in, in New York State and New York right. City. Uh, and so what I don't want is, is that we have a, a very small amount of sites, and I don't know if you're prepared to let us know right now, uh, I said. I said we've so far. You identified process, thirty-seven. We identified thirty-seven. But what's that your we goal? Know, uh, well, our, our goal is to provide uh, as many sites as we can and reasonably conduct the early voting process. But but for so you welcome the one hundred. Uh, well, here's here's the problem. We don't know exactly how that's going to look just yet because. We haven't made a vendor selection with respect to the ballot on demand system and the integration of the electronic poll books. And what those vendors have told us in our initial feedback with them is once that selection is made, we need to get with them and come up with a plan uh, on how that's going to work. Now, one of the and, and training. So all of that's going to come into play. They haven't given you that already. I mean, I would have this to, early on. This should be. We have it to that. an extent, but it's like anything else. Show me the money. Until they're your, uh, you're their customer. You're only going to get, uh, but so much information out of them. But I would think that right. they want you to be their customer. That they will provide yes. this data so you can see what they're able to produce. Right. I mean, I don't so, want to so, so provide funding. I don't want to provide funding and then let on, oh, by the way, this is all we can right. do. I, I want to know what you're able to produce because both companies right. have certain claims right now, have facts. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, want to, I want to be clear. Let's separate out uh, the, the election tabulation system companies uh, from uh, the ballot on demand and the electronic uh, poll book. Right. Yes, right. some of those vendors are in that mix as well, but there are also vendors out there that just do electronic poll books. Uh, and quite frankly, the ones that specialize in the electronic poll books, we've looked at those and we are more impressed uh, with the ease of use and uh, you know uh, what uh, they have to offer in terms of implementation uh, and consultation services. So we do have some rough sketch of what we think it might look like and we're thinking something along the lines of two uh, potentially two electronic poll books for every one ballot on demand printer yeah, right. at these sites but it's it's so preliminary that it would be irresponsible to try to paint that picture it's only been in it, this process has only been unfolding for the last couple of months and we just got the real guidance from the state yesterday which we haven't been able to I d digest uh, since they didn't provide it. But I know you've been anticipating, right. and like you stated, in all fairness to uh, the NYC BOE, is that you're running out of time. And very soon, you have to provide the training, you're gonna have to, they're gonna have to make special adaptation to the procurement process. Mm -hmm. We gotta get moving. Yeah. And we, so- We, we and have been, and we've met with, as Mr. Ryan explained, there are three different types of vendors. It's not the same vendor. Um, and we have already received presentations, not just executive management, but the chief and deputies in every borough have come to the presentations. We've gone through about 17 presentations. While we are in the process of doing that, we are also in the process of having weekly meetings, setting up, discussing the poll sites, the staffing. Um, there's many different elements to this. Um, aside from meeting with the chief and deputies, they also have come in and there's been demonstrations for the commissioners as well. Um, we have our procurement already on the, the vendors that, you know, 
we have given feedback on and we have discussed also with the State Board. We're working very closely with the State Board. They're understaffed as well and they're trying their best. I mean, they just came through with rules and regulations yesterday, but we have extended our help with the State Board to say we would be happy to come up and sit with you and other um, different jurisdictions to come and sit to help with. We have to go through reconciliation at the end of the evening. It will be different from what we do um, on, on election night. Um, so there's different procedures that have to be written that the State Board is still in the process of doing. We have begun writing our own procedures. Of course, we would are gladly, and we have been, giving our ideas to the State Board, as well as other jur jurisdictions, I heard. But this is not just finding poll sites, getting vendors, having training. A lot of different aspects. And that's why we are looking to phase in. What we have for our early voting now is not what it's going to be for our presidential. That's going to be a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're looking at a, a, a turnout this year that is not going to be what we're going to have for a no, presidential absolutely. primary. And so, yes, this came very quickly to everyone. And everyone was shocked. Oh, my God, how are we going to do this? But then, you know, taking a step back and looking at everything, this is probably the best year to do it. Uh, if we, they would have told us we had to do this for a presidential election, I think there would have been mass hysteria. So we are looking to phase in every aspect of election law. We want the voters to have a great experience. We are looking forward to working with the mayor's office, the city council, every aspect of government to ensure this is a success. There will be obstacles. Nothing will be perfect. Every jurisdiction that we have spoken to has said, we hit this obstacle, we hit that obstacle, and of course we're taking what they're giving and we're, we're saying, okay, this is great. You know, we're learning from another jurisdiction, but guess what? We're gonna hit our own obstacles. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be many lessons learned if everyone remembers 2010 when we rolled out the electronic voter system. Do you, does everybody remember the primary? It was chaos. There were lessons learned. We rolled out that system in eight months eight months and we predict the set we we don't want chaos but we predict there will be lessons learned uh appreciate that we're trying to get rid of the perforated ballots i think they are antiquated i think they I sh we all know here the nightmare that we went through uh two previous elections uh are all this vent are all the vendors uh prepared to have 32 inch paper ballot. Uh, what what do you see in that? No, the the um the biggest ballot that can be produced um, is a 19 inch ballot. That's with the stub. I I suspect that if the stub requirement goes away, yes, without uh, the stub we'll, requirement, right? Then we'll reclaim that inch at the top, and we can go up to a uh, to a. I, I'm not sure if it's 20 or 21 inches, but that'll help. I mean, every little bit of room on those big paper ballots uh, makes a difference. Uh, but the other thing that I did well, want. Wait a second, just sure. for, I, 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 you know, right next to us, we there's two vendors that they give right. a demonstration, and if I understood right, you could have a paper ballot that could be up to 20 something inches 30 inches uh, is, that a, is that allowed that, by state law uh, i mean if we, if we were to change the state law if would that be something that you're looking if the to machine that? if the I, i'm not familiar with that particular uh ballot length uh, but if the machine can tabulate it then there is no restriction on the length when when i say that we're restricted to the length we've been restricted to the length by the technology uh, by the ability of the scanner to scan a ballot of a certain length, not by uh, statutory function. Well, I saw uh, the, if the Dominion, the okay. one uh, by Dominion, I believe it's Evolution. Uh, 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 yes, the image cast Evolution. Evolution, and uh, I was told that it could go to, they have the ability to, if I run it right, up to 32 inches. Yes. So that, that would sound to me that even if, based on what you're telling me right now, that it could avoid all the problems that we had last time, even if there was not a change of rules by the state be, uh, right. really. now, is that correct? That, that is presently not our vendor, and the, uh, our vendor contract runs through 2021. Uh, so as I stated back 
uh, in. Are you allowed uh, to have two vendors? Uh, you can have no more than two vendors. That that is correct. Right now, you only have one. Right now, we we, we only have uh, one. Uh, the a decision was made by the commissioners to to make sure that we had one unified operating system because at the end of it, uh, the piece of the puzzle that kind of gets lost in the sauce and taken for granted is um, e ERM, which is the uh, election uh, results management portion of this, is how we report uh, results out at the end of the night. Uh, and we have, uh, for all of the criticism that the board gets, we have that piece of the puzzle uh, pretty well uh, down. Uh, I, I know that we've taken a lot of the mystery uh, and the angst uh, out of election nights with how well we're doing that. Uh, so one of the reasons we were able to do it that way was because we have now a wholly uh, integrated system. That contract is due to expire in the early part of 2021. Uh, the state board, I am sure, is going to engage in other vendors. Right now we only have two. We don't know, as the city board, how many other vendors may be ultimately available uh, for consideration as this contract ages out. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have to let that process uh, play itself out. But I also want to point out, when, when I uh, sat before this committee uh, back in November, um, I pointed out the fact that, that those choices get made at the state level and then ultimately uh, the 62 counties uh, are told uh, the parameters of with, within they must act. And so right now uh, there are two uh, potential vendors, but the other piece of the puzzle that kind of got glossed over a little bit earlier, yes, the mayor has uh, made $75 million available, but there's also an additional $21 million made available for the acquisition of electronic poll books, uh, which kind of separates those two things out. One is the space uh, and the people, and the other is a, a, a little bit uh, the technology. So my and it's not going to be enough. Total of ninety six. Is that twenty is going to be enough for the poll book? Because um, I know we talked about last time. Yes. We weren't uh, sure. It, it, do you think that's going to be? It's twenty one million, and we think that that would be a sufficient number for full implementation of electronic poll books, not just for early voting. Uh, and as Miss Sandow uh, suggested a, a few moments ago, um, it's a lot to get through. Uh, but there is some wisdom and value in having, making the transition to electronic poll books now uh, and getting that under uh, our belts in November and then moving forward uh, into the presidential year that we will have had elections where they're used. But those electronic poll books, whoever you select now, it's going to be kind of tied in who you select in 2021, right? Uh, no. no. That's what I was saying earlier. With I know you mentioned Electronic that. poll book vendors. We have uh, electronic identified electronic poll book vendors that are voting tabulation system agnostic. Okay. They will gotcha. work with whatever you have and make it happen. That's great. Uh, and that's their job is to make it happen. Point so it. that's a... Uh, um, Let me make this uh, last point, and I'm going to pay, uh, pass it on to my colleagues and starting with the uh, sponsor of the bill, which I, I want to make a, actually a personal uh, point here. Uh, I was raised in, I was born here in the Bronx, went to Puerto Rico, I was four years old. All I knew how to say in English was chess <laughs> y no. <laughs> and I would tell people no all the time because I was always afraid that I would say yes to something illegal. Somebody was asking me to do something bad. I know my colleague Rodriguez um, fully understands because he went through the same experience. It is a very scary, <sighs> you get a bit emotional because it's a bit, you, you carry like this uh, embarrassment, shameful, because you know, people make fun of your accent and people. So to avoid all that, uh, especially when you're young, uh, you just avoid things. I, I heard the heart of my colleague speaking and that story. There are a lot of people in my district who you know, in different districts, especially in districts where we don't have language um, interpreters that they feel they can identify with, that they would just avoid election altogether 
because of that awful, awful feeling. It's hard to describe if you had not gone through it. Maybe, you know, it's not like you go on vacation, you don't speak the language. You know you're coming back to the United States and right. speak the language. You have to live here. And so I, it is my hope that we will come to the meeting of the minds and, and to do it soon because we cannot allow what we, the status quo that we have right now to continue. And, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, and I know you have comments, but I'm going to uh, pass it on to my colleague because really that's where the discussion is really taking place. So let me pass it on uh, uh, to- Mr. Chairman, if, if I may have a, a personal moment as well. Sure. Um, I, I want to be clear, uh, like you, I have a personal story, and part of my personal story is my wife is first-generation American. My in-laws uh, came after World War II uh, and didn't speak English. The first election that my father-in-law voted in was in November of 2007 when I ran for district attorney in Staten Island. Hmm. And the reason he voted in that election and hadn't voted previously was exactly all of the reasons that you're talking about. So I understand that not only as a professional, but from a personal uh, perspective as well. And that's why I said earlier that there's not daylight in the positions. It's just a question of how are we going to use the tools available to us to get the job done. So, Thank you. Council Member. Thank you. Thank you again, Chair. And I, I will try to be very brief because we have a lot of I have a hearing myself coming up very soon. Um, Welcome back, uh, Director Ryan, and uh, I appreciate that you brought copies of the state bills that are working its way through through Albany. Just point of information, they were born out of our efforts. I have been in contact with those sponsors every step of the way, and they are equally as frustrated as we are that this has not been already implemented in, in the city of New York. But on the topic of the state bills, has the Board of Elections taken a position on those state bills, and do you plan to testify in favor of them when they hold hearings? We have uh, been in contact with the state legislators, and we take we will I presume, and I can't get out in front of the commissioners on this, but the position that we typically take with respect to legislation that is legitimate on its face and doesn't, you know, uh, uh, really uh, create onerous uh, operational difficulty uh, is that. If it is passed into law, we will implement it, and our role in that legislative process is to typically state what needs we would require in order to do implementation. And so we stay out of the, 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 the yay or nay merits of the bill, and we stick to the operational side of it, and we can certainly provide information to the state legislature on what our staffing needs would be based on what we already do for other language services and just expanding uh, that in that regard. But you, Everyone should have assurances that if that is passed into state law and the governor signs it, the city board of elections will obey state law without question. But has the right. board of elections uh, provided any opinion on this issue uh, before? Uh, in, uh, in a formal way, no, but in the way that government works where there are conversations back and forth amongst staff, amongst, uh, amongst principals, um, uh, yes. I, I, I uh, do believe that Commissioner Shimon, if I'm not mistaken. Is the microphone on? Commissioner Shimon. Uh, during one of our hearings when our democracy officer came to speak, uh, basically said from the very beginning that if this is passed and it is state law, we will move forward and do everything that is stated in that bill to ensure that we require the languages for what's in the bill. And it was stated. Right. And if I heard correctly, you're saying that the only entity that you're uh, interested in complying with uh, is the state legislature. Um, we heard earlier testimony from our the city administration, and you're well aware that a, a referendum was passed in the city of New York establishing a civic engagement commission to establish a program that has not been fully baked yet. Right. So are you, are you stating that the Board of Elections is not looking to comply? No. What I'm saying is we would like this state process uh, to be completed. Uh, if the state process is completed uh, and it views uh, a favorable passage on this legislation, then the question of 
what's left to do for the Civic Engagement Commission vis-a-vis uh, -vis language and translation services uh, becomes uh, a moot point uh, as far as I see it. Uh, now, I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, if it's not a moot point, then we will uh, have further conversations with the Civic Engagement Commission once it's fully constituted and we can engage them uh, in, uh, in meaningful conversation. Uh, and if they make proposals, I'm sure that those proposals will be, uh, will be uh, properly considered by the Board of Commissioners. And if six out of ten of them say uh, to, to do a certain thing, uh, then we'll, we'll do whatever that thing is. Uh, but we're hopeful that we will get... Uh, a, a state uh, resolution with clarity that gives us the ability to move forward uh, and be uh, in, a, in a legal and reasonable way uh, that would insulate the, the board from uh, lawsuits, uh, you know, successive lawsuits from other groups that uh, feel that they have uh, not been properly served uh, by the process. Director Ryan. Uh, well, yes. Or candidates for that matter. Correct. Historically, the only lawsuits that, are, that have been that have come about is when the Board of Elections failed to provide additional languages. I am cognizant of the history of Bengali being added in Queens. That was not because the Board of Elections suddenly added languages. It's because you did not add languages. And the Board of Elections actually was contesting this in court. Well, and, it, and it required a federal court decision, a federal court decision to, to force the Board of Elections to provide additional language services under the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and I mm -hmm. want to also just say, if I'm hearing you correctly, that you believe the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution prohibits the city of New York to add additional languages? No, that's to not what I said. More services what, what, and, for, and, for I, and, I, and I And I appreciate the fact uh, that I think like a lawyer. Uh, so I'll try to say it not thinking like a lawyer. If, if you give a service to a particular group that gives, it doesn't prevent you from giving service to that group, but what it does is it gives the ability of other groups similarly situated to say, hey, you gave services to those folks over there, how come you're not giving those same services to me? And that's the snowball effect that we're concerned about moving forward. Well, the candidate. Voluntarily, and, 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 and I'll use uh, you know, your expression from earlier, voluntarily moving the goalpost to include a particular group gives rise to other groups saying, hey, what about me? And then where does that stop? How do we stop that, that, that avalanche of uh, services that are going to be provided potentially by virtue of court order on short notice? Anything can be accomplished by this government and by this Board of Elections with the proper amount of planning and lead time. So those are the concerns that we have. It's not over a question of whether or not voters should get services. It's how are those services going to be provided and who's going to provide them and what's the standard and criteria we're going to use in order to establish those groups that are going to get services. And uh, I, I know you made some ish, uh, statements with respect to the Bengali. Mr. Richmond is prepared to uh, address the historical uh, issue uh, related to the Bengali litigation, if, if you so well, wish to. Well, I'm interested hear in hearing about, did it require a court decision for the Board of Elections to add Bengali? No. Why was there a lawsuit? So there you go. Now, now Ms. Oh, Hayes. Please. Please. <laughs> Frank, sorry. Give me one second. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth um, in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. My name is Stephen Richmond. I'm the general counsel for the board. Councilman, when the director of the census made the designation, he did not designate Bengali. He designated Asian Indian, an artificially created accommodation. The board had a concern because the official language of India that they use for voting and all other purposes is English. And there was no guidance coming from the Department of Justice. So the board initially engaged in discussion with the Department of Justice. The next step is when they thought we board made the determination to implement that by using Bengali, there was a concern that we were not providing the additional services in terms of a formal language assistance plan 
that was created when preclearance existed uh, and covered for Chinese and um, uh, Chinese language assistance, specifically the advisory groups, etc. What the litigation was and was resolved was that the board, by adopting the program that it did to implement the Asian Indian designation, met the requirements uh, without doing a formal negotiating a formal um, agreement between the parties or a formal language assistance plan, so there was no compulsion there. The problem was there was no guidance coming from the Department of Justice or the director of the census when they made the designation of Asian Indian for Queens County because there is no language called Asian Indian, and as I said, the official language of India happens to be English. Why do these concerns rise to the level of a federal court? Because certain groups were not satisfied with the way the board implemented it, and yet the court found that the board implemented it properly. And there is no federal court order in place with respect to Asian Indian language assistance in the city of New York. So why wasn't Bengali added prior to the court, the court decision? Now, the board had a problem in terms of determining... Mr. Richmond, it's a very simple question. If, if what you're saying are these, these technicalities on language, geography, nations... Why wasn't Bengali added prior to the court decision? Bengali was added prior to the court decision. How we implemented it was the question. The problem was first determining what does Asian Indian language assistance mean? And that took over a year of discussions, including the Department of Justice, because there is no such language as Asian Indian. It's relatively easy. When the Department the Director of the Census designated Chinese, that language is very clear. When they designated Korean, there's one Korean language. There is no language as Asian Indian. And that's the problem that the board had to engage in, and the Department of Justice provided the civil rights, the voting section of the Department of Justice's civil rights division, basically said, make it up. And that's what we did. So, Mr. Richmond, to be clear, there was no such service prior to the court decision. I understand. There was no such service until the director of the census designated Asian Indian in Queens County because uh, there was no legal obligation for right. the board to provide it it. it. it warranted a court decision to actually move this process forward. And my no. point, my point, well, that's not correct. The, the, there's no court decision requiring Bengali in the city of New York. That was a voluntary action taken by the board. I'm sure Al Def and others. What was would, questioning, would and again, there was but no court order either. Mr. Richmond, so. the point is, we heard from Director Ryan that if you add more languages, it opens up more lawsuits. We've seen historically there's lawsuits when you don't add more languages. There's nothing in federal law or state law or city law that prohibits the BOE from adding more languages today. Nothing. There's nothing against the law. The city, city agencies, we have passed a number of local laws in this council, in this body, adding more language access across agencies. I am not aware of a flood of lawsuits that were filed the next day. So we are in the business of trying to help and empower people, and nothing prohibits the Board of Elections from doing the same. And unlike the early voting measure, this is not an unfunded mandate. We offer to you, my, my colleagues mentioned before about the different agencies involved in here. We've been going in circles because the goalposts have been shifting. We, we've heard that it was, an, it was a lack of resources. The city is willing to pay for it. There was, we thought of Moya because Moya has immigrant affairs in it. We want to help our immigrant communities. But the Board of Elections has a problem with Moya because it has the word mayor in it. So CFB has a voter assistance advisory committee, which has enormous credibility. CFB does good work on this issue. And yes, we would have to establish a new program because no program like this exists right now because the BOE refuses to accept city resources and establish its own. So that's why we're going in circles here. And now you have a referendum that passed, and when I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you don't intend to comply with the referendum. I've, I've, that question honestly has been asked and answered already, and I, and I uh, disabused you of that notion a few moments ago, and I would appreciate you not repeating that. I did not say we would not cooperate. What I said was, and I encourage patience on allowing the state process to complete itself, because if the state process completes itself favorably to your position, then the rest of the conversation is moot. That was something that I said very clearly not that long ago. 
So I appreciate the tussle back and forth over Asian Indian, but I don't appreciate the tussle back and forth over misconstruing what I said, because I didn't say that. So, and I don't want that to be the, the narrative that we walk out of here with. Please, I'm asking you as respectfully as I can. We will engage with the Civic Engagement and Commission at the appropriate time. We are hopeful that the state legislative process will resolve itself and we'll have clear guidance. If we don't, we'll be off in a different direction with the Civic Engagement Commission. I, I, am, not, I am not clear in your answer, Director Ryan, respectfully as well. Uh, because if I heard your testimony correctly, you're, you're waiting on the state to act. We'd love for the state to act immediately as well. Let me tell you why they didn't act for many years. Because Senate Republicans blocked our efforts every step of the way. But there's a new day in the Senate. Thank goodness. And now we have leadership in the Senate that actually cares about voters, all voters in New York. That's why we couldn't get things passed in the state. But again, just to close off, close off here, Director Ryan, we have disagreements on language access that is, is not lectioneering. We have disagreements on the definition of, of inside of a, of a poll station. And quite frankly, it's disappointing that there's a, there's a disagreement on the application of equal protection clause of the Constitution. Nothing prohibits the BOE from doing this now. And just to wrap up, Mr. Chairman, I heard the testimony and I read your testimony here about early voting, and I appreciate you know, the predicament that you're in, that this was passed recently, uh, and the board ha has, to now, has, to, has to now adopt the program. Mm -hmm. But early voting has been in existence in this country since the, since the first half century of its, of its existence. Mm -hmm. Nothing stopped the BOE from preparing at least a study or some sort of analysis done, how do we operationalize this should this move forward in New York? Nothing. And I'll close on that note. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, let me pass it on to Councilmember Rodriguez, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. First of all, I, I agree with my colleague. It, I think that it is our responsibility as a city to provide the services to every single group. Uh, the city of New York is not the one that we had in the 1900 census. The 1900 census in New York City was 96% white. 2% black, Latino, we were not counting. And today in the 2019, the New York City population is 38% of all born and raised in other countries. The rest of you guys, as many other, has a grandfather born and raised in other places. We also carry on this story about being discriminated, all of us, Irish, Italian, Jewish, Afro American, Latino. So I believe that it is a great day today that we have as leader that we can leave our fingerprint, you know, taking the city to another level. We are New York City. And I feel that, as you have said, it is our responsibility to learn from other places. But we need to take the lead. And we have, and we are a strong individual. We have a lot of resources. And we have the commitment, you know, to be the role model of the nation that we would like to see. Uh, so, you know, the city changing, I think that, uh, providing the services, she was started from the rational. That is not only about what can we do. The services it's about the right to be sure that every the 8.5 million New Yorkers feel and they know that they are entitled to get their right respect. And I think that one of those. And again, it's not a, for me. It's not about an individual. It's about we as a city that had to move and to change the culture. I think that translation is something that. And not only because I'm the native Spanish speaking, and I have my accent, and the media, they had to look at me very careful to understand what I'm saying. But that's, <laughs> I'm one of those New Yorkers, you know, that not only pay my taxes and contribute to the city and therefore do my contribution to other great city of New York, but as I being able to move myself from being as washing dishes to be where I am today, here in the fiber of New York City, there's so many New Yorkers that they pay their taxes, that they expected their services to be provided. And one of those about how the, the best experience to vote. It, one of my concerns for me is about how does the board election hire the polling site workers. I think that that culture has to stop. You know, that sprint where the, the workers, they are referred by the district leaders, and then the, the whole establishment that they control many of those jobs, we need to continue making changes, you know, because when I see any particular district, you know, the workers, the, the, the polling workers uh, sites, they should reflect the community where those elections are taking place. 
we should not have issue with people who will speak their language in those neighborhoods. And I think that for me, and you can name it, can go, I is 52, Broadway Academy. And here you say, great workers, but they don't speak the language of a community that is mainly Spanish speaking. So how, what is the process of hiring the workers? How can we do better? How can we guarantee that 100% of the polling sites also are covered with real quality translations? That for me is big concern. I also feel that we as a city should put all the resources. We should allow, we should open polling sites to be open a hospital, high school. They are. They are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. They're not. You can name it one. I, I say know. hospitals. I said, I'm sorry, I know that we address, I say, if we don't have it as a policy to say, the places where there's like a big gathering of people, we should aim, come back to us, let's put the resources, let's look at Columbia New York Hospital, let's look, I'm not talking about one, okay, I'm talking about we planning together. Let's look at high school, let's incentivize the high school, the senior who already can vote to also say, we open polling sites. Let's open polling sites in detention centers. You know, let's open polling sites in colleges. No, I don't, I know, we, I, I got the answer assigned. You can name it one or two places, but I say we as a city. Yes, imagine that the 19 or 20 campus at CUNY also open polling sites. We will see a larger participation of people voting in those places. C correct. So how can we expand voting participation? And of course, I want to end hoping that you already start planning together because I will be pushing back the effort to allow New Yorkers with green cards and working permits to also vote in municipal yeah. elections. Well, it has to be passed. We, we, don't have, we don't have the authority to... No, for the doubt. I know the last okay. one is a comment. That's right. <laughs> okay. No, the first one on the right. workers. That for me, right. translation. So, so the poll workers, uh, so the poll workers, um, I can't speak for every single poll site clearly throughout the city, but I can tell you that as an overall proposition, uh, election law requires that we... Uh, consider uh, poll workers that come from the, the party apparatus. It's built into election law. However, that having been said, it used to be that the vast majority of our poll workers uh, came from uh, party organizations. However, that's no longer the case. Uh, that number uh, tipped lower than 50 percent several years back and has been dropping uh, every year uh, since then. So we get the majority of our poll workers through election day, our election day worker uh, portal in our, in, our, in our website. And um, we weren't able to pull it off last year because of some contracting difficulties. But you might remember a couple of years back, we had, uh, with the Department of Health, we piggybacked off their contract and we did uh, ads on the bus, become a poll worker, ads on the subway, become a poll worker. Uh, and, and we did the same thing uh, for interpreters as well. Uh, that's an expensive uh, proposition, uh, but it's a worthy one. I mean, we ended up probably getting a grand total of about 1,500 or 1,600 poll workers from that ad campaign, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, except if you juxtapose that up against the 30,000 poll workers, uh, it's a full 5%. Uh, and when you're talking about needing all the bodies that you could possibly use, 5% uh, makes a difference. So encourage anyone uh, that you know to go on to Election Day Worker, uh, sign up to become a poll worker. They'll be included in the, uh, in the training process, uh, and, and uh, you, you know they'll be able to serve their communities. And we do make a valiant effort uh, to place those workers as close to home as possible because we recognize uh, that if we're asking them to come there at 5 o'clock in the morning and leave uh, sometime after 10 o'clock at night to then ask them to get on a train and, and, and take a 40-minute train ride someplace uh, is, a, is really unreal. Realistic. So we, we do make uh, those efforts. And there was was there another opening uh, opening uh, polling sites in hospital oh. detention right. center in college. Well, so so detention centers I could dispense with very quickly. It's against the law. Uh, so that's a you know unless the law is changed, you can't open a, a, a vote uh, center in an, in a detention center. Uh, but moving to the other sites, we will consider and we consider all poll sites. If there's uh, and it really does come down to a, a district by district, block by block exercise. I know. Uh, uh, Councilman Rodenstall, we, we've, we've dealt with this process and we've looked at the maps and, you know, we do all of that. So if individuals have 
sites that they want considered for poll sites think that you're aware CUNY. of. I'm sorry, Chairman. You think about CUNY. Oh. Yeah. You know, if, if, college, cops, if you, if you have the ability uh, to get us into those CUNY facilities and, 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 and break down those doors and let us in, uh, then I'm certainly uh, happy because you're right. They're often very centrally located. They're big uh, locations. Um, we, we, we use Columbia Presbyterian. We use... We right. I, I, uh, for example, on hospitals, not in my district, not right. Columbia Presbyterian, my district. Yes, Columbia Presbyterian, the Health Science Center opposite the Armory. Okay. We use as a poll site. Uh, we use, um, I'm trying to remember, on Roosevelt Island, I think it's either Collier or, or Goldwater, which has a big okay. area there. In terms of colleges, CUNY that makes available space, we do. I know we have a poll site in Medgar Evers, we have a poll site at Brooklyn College at Roosevelt Hall. It's uh, not as across the board as we'd like. Let's put it that way. We uh, do get some cooperation. Not John Jay. We're trying. We're trying. Uh, We're trying. Right trying. Now, John Jay has, <laughs> in the past has given us concern about using some of the, the larger spaces given their athletic activities and the others. But Mr. Ryan referred to earlier the stack of letters we've got of objections. They included not so far uh, only Sunnis actually objected to the designation the, in the Manhattan site, but we've also had objections from private colleges that have tax exemptions and large spaces because it's going to interfere with everything from a basketball tournament to the, the to their physical education activities. Uh, and But in terms of high schools, the Department of Ed has been very cooperative recently. Uh, in the last five elections, at le every borough that I've been into there's at least one or two, we're most, most high schools because they have bigger space. But again, we're, we're also in elementary schools, g intermediate schools as well. The Department of Ed has the least legal right to say no to us, except when there's physical construction that takes place in facilities. For example, on a site in Brooklyn, where we had a great cafeteria right off the entrance on the first floor. And then they redid the cafeteria and built these permanent tables and like, you know, um, I think I call them uh, diner booths, and now guess what? We can't put voting in there. I, you know, I, see, I know uh, my colleague, as the former chair of the Higher Education Committee, uh, will will be definitely engaged in that conversation and calling the chancellor. And Thirty second, and the whole thing is, if we want our youth to participate in elections, and I'm pretty sure that when CUNY comes to a budget, we should be able to engage CUNY also. I'm happy to hear that you're open. But I feel this is only about to identify one or two sites. If we are able to say the board New York City Board of Election, again, we need to do our part. Mm -hmm. Say we can be able to facilitate polling sites in each campus. Okay. Right. I think that then we can also go and talk to the president and be right. able to. One of the challenges that we, found, we faced a little bit with CUNY as well is that the individual facilities, although they operate under the umbrella of CUNY, they seem to, from the outside looking in, op operate a little bit more uh, independently. So if we could get, uh, you know, a, a foot in the door to have a conversation, uh, you know, at, at a higher level uh, and get some assistance and maybe break down some of the uh, resistance. Cause, and it's not resistance, I don't think, always for the sake of resistance. I want to I want to get to Council Member Russell. Sure. Yes. That. Thank you so much, Chair. Sorry, I'm chairing a hearing on um, gender equity in our schools, so I just had to run out, talk at the rally. I'm going to ask you a few <laughs> questions, and then I'll go chair the hearing. Um, I love the way Councilmember Rodriguez framed the um, language issue, and and uh, it was really powerful hearing Councilmember Cabrera's um, uh, question as well. The same uh, argument is made every day by the disabilities community. So we know that at least 11% of our population self-identifies as having a disability. We know that as our population even grows, a growing percentage are those who are older. And what I don't see and haven't heard anything about in your testimony is what we're doing to ensure that there are ASL interpreters. Um, the deaf community is not taken care of. I'm not hearing your, um, your path to test out the new devices 
um, with uh, people with disabilities and getting their feedback and incorporating their feedback into what the devices can do. Currently, the one thing that, that the board does is test them out at the Disability Pride Parade in July. That's going to be after you purchase the devices, more likely than not. How can you get to the disabilities community prior to purchase of the devices? And finally, um, what's... Oh, sorry. You, why don't you start by yeah, answering those? All right. So uh, we do have, uh, and it was uh, prior to the 2016 general election, uh, the board, and I believe we were the first uh, city entity uh, that did this. We hired two uh, uh, ADA coordinators uh, to work not only uh, on making sure that our poll sites uh, are fully ADA uh, compliant in terms of the ability to get inside, but also uh, to address some of the concerns. Can I just sure. stop you right there and ask you, and what did they do with all the machines that were broken and unusable? Do you know how many sites where that happened? Because my MCA, feedback are you from about the community. The, are you talking about the ballot marking devices? Yes. The, the ballot the, mark the devices that are right. there for the, them. The ballot marking devices are a challenge because they're very old. But you see that's not good enough. Right. So what's your right. plan moving forward? So they have been uh, taken out of taken service. At, the ones that have been broken have been taken out of service. We've been much more on top of that since the uh, bringing on of the ADA uh, compliance uh, staff. Uh, but they, they are an aging machine, and we, we stay on top of them, and it's like having an old car. You try to keep it uh, going. What's as, the plan as going forward with the new devices? What are you doing so for... So there, no, there are no new devices. Um, for people with disabilities. Correct. Uh, the, we made a request of the State Board of Elections to use a, a, a new device, potentially experimentally. That request was denied. That... Uh, process is still uh, moving forward uh, in terms of its overall certification. If that process is ever completed, uh, will will. Uh, when you say process, you mean a new device. Correct. So there are new devices out there. Correct. And the state board of elections has denied the city the ability to use them. Uh, no, not certified. It's it's not a certified machine. We may, we. I, I, if it's not it's certified, in the right. of being certified. Whoa, wait, wait. Has it been denied certification? No. Or it's in the process it's of being certified? It's in the process of being certified. Those two, well, two very different right. things. So, so there, are, th there, are, there are two vendors, only two vendors uh, in New York State that can ser serve as uh, vendor tabulators, they're right? The uh, so they're the only ones that uh, so far have wanted to do business in New York. I can't imagine why. Uh, but. Um, we asked the state for consideration to use one of the newer devices that's not as yet certified. There is another new ballot marking device uh, from another vendor uh, that is not presently our vendor, and our current vendor contract runs through uh, 2021. And you can't ask the current vendor to have a subcontract? Uh, in order to get the device? I mean, isn't this all hands on deck? We're talking about 11% plus of the population. First, that would be a commissioner level decision number one. So, But I, what I actions have you taken to make it better for 11% of our population? It's not good enough. I just want to hear from you a strategy. We, we What's your strategy? What When you go to your commissioners, and beg for people with disabilities to have access to vote. What's your strategy with them? How do they respond? Have they given you well, authority first, to have uh, more? How do people who are member, deaf get member, ASL you're, you're, translators? You're, you're, you're well, pardon? We meet with DRA regularly. We, we meet with the disability rights advocates on a regular basis, but. You're, you're making an anecdotal asser assertion. I'd be happy to have this conversation with you in detail, as we've had other conversations uh, in detail. Uh, but that's making it sound as if we've done nothing with respect to the disability community. And I would say that that is absolutely not true. We have over 500, over 500 of our 1,200 poll sites have uh, accessible ramps that we've contracted with over 17, I think it's 17, it might be up to as many as 20 vendors uh, to provide access to facilities that they 
previously would not have had access to, and that has been an ongoing process uh, since 2014. And it is now in the in the tune of millions of dollars that, I, that have been spent I on I mean, that. you know that for people who don't have access, what you're saying is irrelevant. For people who, in the same way, that somebody who speaks one of the 154 languages in Danny Drum's district is not satisfied with all the answers. But here we're talking about 11% of the population. And what I'm hearing from you is that 40% of your poll sites um, have uh, special features. What about the other 60%? The, the other, uh, look, the other yeah. sites don't require them. Every one of our Does every sites, site have an ASL interpreter? No, that the purpose the of the ballot marking device, device uh, which was put into place by the board prior to uh, the electronic voting machines, the purpose of that ballot marking device is to provide uh, access uh, to the individuals who have site hearing and uh, manual uh, dexterity and, uh, and, and, and speech issues. So it, it has all of the functionality. And your workers, are they trained? Because I'm hearing that people show up and get no help and similarly just are embarrassed and turn around. Uh, so yes, the answer is the poll workers are trained uh, with respect to the to the ballot marking Are they devices. tested and can I have the results of the no. test? Do they really all know all what all they're doing? Pass the test. They all have to pass the test in order to work. But if there is a specific issue that you want to discuss with us so that we can then maybe, if you bring it to our attention, we can then look up and see who was the poll worker working on that BMD and remove them and see if they need extra training. Or maybe they should be put into a different position and not taking care of the ballot marking device. I, I I hear you say we're meeting with the disabilities community all the time. Yeah, I hear right. you say community. that no. if you give us a specific example, we'll fix it. What I'm not hearing is a proactive commitment to making sure that those with disabilities are welcomed into poll sites. And yes, I'm happy to meet with you afterwards and pursue this, but the feedback that I've gotten from the disabilities community is that all those meetings and all those efforts, of course extraordinary, are not good enough. Oh. And and Okay, so so the sooner after an election event that we get notified with respect to an issue, the better well, off we'll be in, in, in terms of that fixing it moving forward. But I want to but I want to stress something. We have two ADA coordinators. One of our ADA coordinators is in fact hearing impaired, and requires the uh, use of translation services in order to do his job. So, so the point is, if there are specific examples of places where we're acting in a deficient manner, we're happy to bring you in and sit down with our ADA coordinators. These folks know this stuff. This is their job, and I believe that they've been doing a very good job up to this point. Uh, but if something, if we're, if we're not aware of something, we can't fix it. And so we remain available to have these conversations. You and I have had uh, conversations. You've been to our office about other things. We're certainly happy. If you, if you see that there's a glaring issue I someplace. Yeah, then, I appreciate that. Right, then bring I really it to our do. attention, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we're doing it now, but let's, let's have a conversation about the specifics, and you can I appreciate that, and I need to turn it back yep. to the chair, so we'll definitely follow up, because right. there are hundreds of thousands of people with disability who are excluded from voting today, right. and we need to increase accessibility for everyone. Right, but I, right. I think if you have an opportunity to meet our ADA staff, uh, you'll have a different impression I, about the I efforts. don't, I assume you're doing your job right. well and they're doing their job well. That That's my assumption. Right. We're all public servants doing the best we can. Right. What I'm saying is there are hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities who don't have access gotcha. to okay. poll sites right. and to voting. And what are we doing about them? Right, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me pass it on to Council Member Yeager, followed by Council Member Kalos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Director, good afternoon. I good think afternoon. sometimes when you come before this council, it's helpful uh, uh, if you would start off with some basics. So uh, let's just start off with some basics. You created by the New York City Charter? Uh, no. Okay. What, uh, what, what authority are you created? Your, uh, uh, primarily the New York State Constitution. Okay. If this council were to legislate that, say, you know, um, 
Uh, the Board of Elections can only blo- buy black pens, and the mayor signs that bill. You get the bill. Can you rip it up, throw it in the garbage, ignore it? Well, when it comes to procurement, that's a little bit of a different issue. Right? If you, fu- you stay we, away from the money because we have you guys fu- still have the power of the person. We have to fund you. I get that. <laughs> yes, you do have to, you. You okay. have to fund our basic If we choose right. not to fund you, right. right, then you can't operate. That's pretty much what's on us. But right. we can't direct your operations. Is that correct? Correct. And the, and the election law actually puts a, a little bit of a parameter around that and says within the amounts appropriated by the local uh, uh legislative government and by the local government. We give you a little less, you do a little less. We give you a little more, you do a little more. Correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we understand, because it seems to me that that what I often hear uh, at this table and across the street is uh, you're going to do what we tell you to do and you're going to like it. And I'm not really sure that that book to your right uh, backs that up. Um, The New York State Constitution requires that boards of election function as uh, bipartisan entities. Now, it doesn't have to be Democrat and Republican. Whatever two parties get the most number of votes, uh, first place and second place, in a gubernatorial election, uh, that's who runs it. And and that's done for a reason, and it's done uh, to keep as much of the politics of the day out of the operation of the board of elections. So you're 100% correct. I like that. She's better that. She's better at this than I am. I like the direct <laughs> answers. I don't hear that I'm 100% correct around here that often, so I appreciate right. that. Um, uh, the let, let me get something else out of the way. Do you not want people to be able to vote? Of course not. We want every, every person who's registered and has a desire to vote on election day to be able to vote. Absolutely. Yes, so no, no chance that you're... Uh, rolling around, Mr. Director, Madam Deputy, and uh, uh, engaging in an illegal effort to suppress votes, no, illegal we or otherwise. Well together, even though he's a Democrat <laughs> and I'm a Republican. That's right, very <laughs> bipartisan. Republicans do want people to come out and vote also. So, but but just, to be, just to be very clear, no efforts to suppress votes. Uh, I'm, no. no, absolutely not. And, and I'm a lawyer by trade, uh, and uh, despite the reputation of lawyers, we get attracted to the to the profession because it is this it is the bastion between uh, organization and anarchy. Okay. And I respect the law, and the board respects the law. There was a question uh, uh, by a gentleman here earlier, um, uh, and you responded uh, to set the record straight. I want to make sure that the record is set even straighter, if you will. Um, is there a single city agency that? you wouldn't work with if they picked up the phone and wanted to have a conversation about your work? Absolutely not. And for those that know me, uh, conversing is something I I do, I don't know if well, but certainly excessively. Okay. So, uh, (laughs) fair enough. Well, that may be your inner lawyer. Um, Once the Civic Engagement Commission gets its its feet wet and gets its business going, uh, you'll work with them to the extent that you are legally able to pursue into your governing documents, which are the state constitution and the state election law. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. And uh, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, you haven't ignored their phone calls either, right? No. Okay. So basically what I've seen, what I've read in the paper is uh, there's a policy dispute, if you will. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the of the translation programs. I've, I've said that uh, here across the street, a uh, number of hearings that you've been at, I support what Moya's trying to do, I support what the mayor's trying to do. Um, and but obviously there's within the parameters of what you're allowed to do. I am not an expert in your work. Um, I assume that you're maybe not an expert in my work. Maybe you are. Uh, but I don't. I don't tell you how to do something. The way I look at it is, I want to be able to support the administration's desire to provide as many translation services in as many locations as are legitimately possible in as many languages as are possible. For example, in my community, um, you know, Bengali may not be the issue of the day, but we have Yiddish, we need Russian, we need Arabic, we need Italian, we need, we're getting that not necessarily out of the, uh, out of the federal requirements that you were already undergoing, but we were getting that through the Moya operation. Yes. Okay. I know that was a long-winded, but that was a yes. That was good. Um, did you, did your agency engage in any way to stop Moya's work from occurring in the last election or in the election prior thereto? 
No. Okay. And we are status quo in that regard, you know, pending the resolution uh, of, the, of the, the current litigation. Okay. And to be clear about something else that I heard you say, because there was some confusion about um, uh, what you meant when you referred to the Equal Protection Clause, you weren't saying that the Equal Protection Clause stops you from, just, you know, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing what you said, stops you from providing uh, translation services. What you were saying, if I understood it correctly, yes. uh, is that the Equal Protection Clause requires that if you offer a service to a particular group and then do not offer that service to other groups, which then may have a lawful constitutional claim, you would then, by having offered it to the first group, be violating the Constitution. Potentially, yes. Potentially. And, and so the simplest phrase that you can that you can hear and, and digest to make an equal protection clause determination is likes must be treated alike. That is the guiding premise of equal protection. And when you look at it through that prism, you understand that the expansion uh, could become unwieldy. Uh, and, and that litigation could become uh, plentiful. Especially from a candidate. I mean, if there's, if there's two candidates running and one of them is uh, Polish and we're only putting Polish interpreters in the poll site for that election and the other candidate is Italian, that candidate can say that we're, tr not us, but the mayor's office is trying to sway the election. Well, that candidate would be right if that candidate were, in my estimation, if that candidate would right. go to court because you put your thumb on the scale. And the entire process is, has to be is set up to require that your agency not put its thumb on the scale. Right. I want to so, ask, you know, yeah, Ms. Ms. Sandow did point out that, the, you know, that there are candidates involved as well. Right. Uh, you know, I was focusing on the voters, but she's absolutely right. right. There are candidates. Uh, you know, there are candidates that could, that could take a look at a program if it doesn't have clear, clearly defined rules and say, wait a second, you, you know, you, you hurt me because uh, this, this other group got services and, and my group didn't get services. And then you could be in a position of having to redo an election. Especially if the services are not consistent. So if you're going to provide services for specific languages, and this is a citywide election, and let's just, for example, it's in March and we're providing services for Yiddish, in um, a specific area. And then there's another citywide special six months later, all of a sudden there's no Yiddish in that poll site anymore where there was six months ago, but now it's someplace else. Well, you'll hear from we, me then. We cannot, <laughs> right? But we, we can't conduct elections that way. If, if we're gonna provide services, they need, there needs to be a formula and it needs to be consistent. The services cannot change from election to election. That does not look well. It, uh, it doesn't thank you. Comply. Thank you, Madam Deputy. I, I left something out when we were talking about your governing documents, which is, uh, uh, as I referred, it's the state constitution and the state election law, but there's something else that, uh, that from time to time governs your operations, and that's a court order. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So every once in a while, a court order is issued and uh, not necessarily in compliance with uh, our current understanding or even the letter of the law as it's written, but a judge has the right to issue a directive to the board and the board then has an obligation and it's either state or federal court has an obligation to follow that order to the T. Correct. Okay. So um, I, I, I support, as I said, uh, the, the mayor's program that's currently run out of Moya and I know you're engaged in litigation over it, but at the end result of that litigation, it's anticipated because you can't settle election law cases, um, there's going to be an order. And Correct. the order is going to say either the Board of Elections is right or the mayor is right or somewhere in the middle is where it meets. But it's going to set, usually, that's the way orders are written, it's going to set up guidelines. This is what the board is obligated to do. This is what Moy is obligated to do. And then you're going to have a set of rules. Correct. Okay. So engaging in the litigation is not in and of itself an effort to suppress votes, is it? No. Okay. It's to establish rules. Okay. Well, and rule, rules are good. Correct. I'm violating one right now. I've gone over <laughs> my clock. Mr. <laughs> Chairman is glaring at me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just have a moment or two. Uh, but then you, then you get uh, my good colleague from Manhattan, and, uh, and, and that'll be as enjoyable at least. Um, 
Uh, we were talking earlier, um, uh, Mr. Director, you were talking earlier with some of my colleagues about poll sites and poll locations. And um, um, I've had this experience. I've only been in office for a few months. Uh, um, but I've uh, almost since the day I started uh, been on the hunt for poll sites in my district. Um, in your experience, how easy is, is it to identify a poll site that meets the obligations and to be clear those obligations are that it has to be available to receive the equipment and to uh, store the equipment for a three-day period and also to conduct an election and open the doors up from five in the morning till whenever after nine o'clock at night how how easy is it to find it, um, it is challenging and it's and it's increasingly challenging yeah. we're we're like when your front doorbell rings and you realize it's somebody that you don't want to let in for a cup of coffee and you dive under the couch and shut the lights off. Well, I would that's never do that to you, Mr. Treated. Director. Uh, that's the way we're treated by a lot of locations. They, they, they want to talk a good game about uh, civic engagement and civic responsibility, but when it comes to putting uh, their, their, uh, their facilities uh, available, uh, they don't do it. You're probably the first to line up outside your door criticizing you, too. Uh, there's a, some of that. All right. Let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you <laughs> a, another question. And I don't know if you have this information uh, at your fingertips, but uh, has it has in recent memory over the last year or two or three, let's say, has there come a time that you have identified a location that meets all the criteria for a poll site to be located there, all the legal criteria, and then said, "Now nah, we don't need it." Uh, no, I mean, if, 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 if we're going about the business of identifying a poll site and it meets the criteria, we intend to use it. Okay. Uh, now, you know, depending uh, from election to election, you know, sometimes sites roll in and roll out. Uh, but what more often happens is we identify a perfect site and then the person or entity that has that perfect site contacts people to put pressure on us not to use them. Say, for example, you identify a wonderful hospital right smack in the middle of the neighborhood. And you say, well, we're going we're gonna to get our way in there because nonprofit, we can get in. And then the hospital's board starts reaching out to all its elected officials and says, hey, you can't let these guys in here because they're going to shut down our cafeteria for three days. Everybody has a phone. Okay, there we go. Very good. Um, you identified, Mr. Director, uh, 37 sites to date uh, as potential early voting sites. Yes. Okay, how many do you anticipate needing at the minimal per the state statute right now? Well, minimum per state statute is 34. 34. So you've exceeded the minimum requirement required by state law. So far, yes. Okay. But as we discussed at the last hearings, you're looking to actually do bigger and better. Correct. To the extent possible. Right. Okay. The, to, I'm sorry, Madam the Deputy. The next phase. The next phase. Okay. Um, uh, and we're, we're looking to have early voting by November. October 26th. Right, October 26th, November elections. Okay. The 37 sites that you've identified, those are signed, sealed, and delivered in the sense that they are – you're shaking your head no. I didn't even finish the question. In the sense that they are able to be used, re, leaving aside whether or not the, the uh, premises – uh, has has granted you the okay, and they're interested in doing this, but in that they, they meet the ADA requirements, yes, they meet the time do. period requirements, they give you the 12 These days. These are all sites that would be good for our use, uh, barring uh, any resistance uh, from the site owners. So, Mr. Director, but I'd be very interested in, in knowing of these 37 sites. I, I don't know where any of them are. I have no secret list. I assume at some point you're going to put that out. Okay, yes. I'd be interested in knowing uh, uh, if there is a package of letters like you waved around earlier received from any of those 37 sites. I hope you put that information out as soon as you get it publicly so that the world understands um, the complexity of finding a place that is not, able, not only able to house the 12 days prior to this election, but we don't want to roll around the city and pick 37 different sites every election. We want to find a place that can, that can do the 12 days of an election and the 12 days of the next one and the 12 days of the next one, and it could be four or five a year right. sometimes. You know, what we've been told is that, you know, with early voting, you're going to have some uh, sites that drop off and, and, and additional sites that move forward, uh, you know, in a, in a new election. But the ideal is to have stable, consistent sites 
where a voter can predictably know where it's going to be so that election in and election out, uh, they, if that's their habit to vote early, they know where to go and we don't have to, you know, constantly engage in a re-education process of, of the voters, certainly. Right. Stability is a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Director. I agree. Stability is a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And again, I think uh, my suggestion that I've been making, that we need to fund it. People aren't telling organizations are not, I mean, that's a, that's a commitment, 13 days. Yes. Uh, we're going to have to fund it. We're going to have to fund it well. Without make question. it attractive. It, so, it would, it's unfair otherwise. Indeed. Council Member uh, Ben Kales. Just so you know. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Uh, Mr. Councilman. <laughs> let, let's uh, start off, uh, and uh, I want to thank my uh, Chair uh, Fernando Cabrera for this important hearing, and my colleague uh, Councilmember Yeager for uh, digging into the questions and leaving some for me. So uh, the state minimum is 34. You are doing 37. Is that correct? We have identified 37 Seven. up to this point, uh, and and Staten Island is only getting six. Is that correct? Correct. Which boroughs are getting the extra poll sites? Well, the, what time is it? <laughs> uh, we, are, we are not prepared to, uh, to, to make that announcement presently. I cannot, I, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to be evasive. It's due tomorrow, number one. Number two, I, had, I still remain, uh, at least as of 115, an employee of the Board of Elections. And I have 10 uh, commissioners that I answer to, and they will be passing on this uh, issue later today. Uh, so it's an unfair position to put me in, quite frankly, to, to get out uh, ahead of my bosses. Uh, and I was given guidance and direction as to what I could say today, and I I've said what I can say. He kind of trapped me off on the Staten Island question. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that, but the 37 is where we can we can land for now. And then, uh, you know, in the, in the coming days, all of this uh, will start to become more clear. And we're we're expecting to engage in ongoing conversations with elected officials, with various groups, with the administration, uh, to say, okay, this is what we got up to this point. What can we collectively reasonably make work for October the 26th and to establish, and I know you weren't here earlier, but the point that I drove home is we need to establish a firm foundation upon which we can build uh, the remainder of the early voting uh, program. New York City has uh, some of the longest elections in actually the state. Uh, our, our primary day is, is longer than not anymore. We switched. Not anymore. Everyone, new, new legislation. The, 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 yes, the rest of the is state good. is happy that we've dragged them along to our point of view. Great. So uh, it, in a standard situation, it is from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., and now that is a statewide, so that is a 15-hour a uh, primary day and, and general election. However, the legislation only calls for a minimum of eight. Uh, for er on early voting, minimum of eight during the week and minimum of five. Is the Board of Elections planning to do the minimum of eight and five, or will you be doing more, particularly on weekends where more people might be likely to vote early? That is also a question that is going to be, uh, it's one of the three uh, legs of this three-legged stool that need to be uh, resolved uh, this afternoon. Uh, so again, uh, not to step on uh, my, my boss's you can't authority. can share the resolutions that will be considered. Uh, uh, under open meetings law, typically, if we're hearing legislation in the council, we make it public before the hearing. You have a, a, apparently a public meeting later today what materials are being voted on? Has that been publicly noticed? There, There's no materials. There, there, there are no materials. It's going to be a publicly uh, conducted uh, conversation and deliberation under, under open meetings law. And I'm certain anybody who's got access to WebEx uh, by virtue of one of the one of the rules that we actually paid attention to, I might re uh, have you recall, that we were the first city entity to comply with the uh, public airing of the meetings when that went into effect. So I'm sure, you know, if I ever get back there and we have a conversation with them, some of these important questions will be addressed. So the you, you know the number is 37. 
That's fine. But that has, but the locations of those pull sites remain a secret despite the fact that you know it and in a couple of hours your commissioners will be taking a position the on it. It's, well. it's not a secret. We're complying with, we're, we're complying with the secret, law. If it's not a secret, then will you please tell us? I don't have the authority to tell you because it's not real until the until the bosses say it's real. So when six commissioners vote, every, six commissioners every day people in the city council introduce legislation. Quite often I agree with it. Some days I want nothing to do with what somebody introduced. But the public process of government is when you're considering something, it is good government, it is open meetings law that you're supposed to make it available for the public to weigh in on so that folks can come prepared right. versus just knowing that, I'm sorry, I did not realize I was on a clock, may I? Of course. Thank you. Uh, I was, was kind of hoping you were going to say no. <laughs> you, Stop hoping. <laughs> So, but, but in all seriousness, um, right. if it isn't a secret, would you please tell us, or if you say you don't have the authority, can you please bring a resolution today of saying, hey, the council member brought up a point that we're actually supposed to be publicly noticing what we're going to vote on before we vote on it as soon as so we know what we're voting it, on. It, 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 it is on the agenda. And then uh, and if you've ever... posted on our website. If you've ever watched our meetings, uh, these... Uh, these exchanges can get quite uh, lively, uh, and uh, at the end of them, things happen when six people say they're going to happen, uh, and if that doesn't happen, then all we had was a lively discussion. So it's six votes uh, carry all the weight, and five votes carry no weight, uh, and that's the way it goes. It's, it's, a, ex it's a legislative process performing an executive function. doesn't always... Uh, dovetail so neatly, but that's the reality of the circumstances. Okay, so today is er – thank you for telling me to find it. So I did find the agenda, and it says, today's agenda, one item, and all it says on it is designation of early voting poll sites and related matters for the November 5th, 2019 general election. It has one item. It doesn't list the number 37. It doesn't say 34. It doesn't have a list of them. It has nothing on it that the You're public can act on. List until May 1st when it comes out. That's when it comes out. If you could have your mic on, please. We'll be Thank voted you. on today. The list will be given to the commissioners today, and there will be a vote. And if there is a vote of six and it is decided that those 37 sites are going to move forward, plus what we phase in, that's what will be. And, and you see nothing wrong with the fact that we have uh, government officials voting on something that the public has not seen, will not see when it's voted on, and it will not be yes, public will, until May 1st. they will be there today. They will, it's a, they will it's a public it meeting. Okay. It's a public meeting. So uh, I appreciate the public. chair, and sorry I got sidetracked. I actually was not expecting this part to be so difficult. <laughs> uh, I, I am – so in terms of the phase-in, uh, are, you, are you aware of the mayor's offer of $75 million? Yes. Uh, have you taken up the mayor on his offer for $75 million for additional well, poll sites? We, we had quite, quite a bit of a colloquy on that uh, earlier. Uh, in, our finance officer has worked uh, closely uh, with the Office of Management and Budget to make sure that the city is in the best position uh, to uh, plan uh, financially uh, for the early voting uh, process uh, moving forward. So, and you mentioned phase-in. Are you open to having more than 37 locations? You know, I've been asking you about yeah, this. Yeah, and, I, and I, I appreciate you asking that question because you're sitting here for the first time, but this has been said sure. uh, so over and over throughout these And the answer is yes? Yes. Great. Now, next thing. So, are you open to doing 100? We are open to doing whatever is reasonable to be able to do within the parameters of reality. Okay, so, so, so I just but, I'm, but, but I'm Councilman, over my time. No, yes. I, I know you're over your time, but but you're you're asking you're asking a question based on a on a a number of a hundred. Now I apologize that you missed the earlier conversation, but we have to know what these early voting sites are going to look like. We haven't even finalized what the ballot delivery system is going to look like. Sure. So on that Next question. So, are you planning on having? Are you planning for an election where every possible voter votes, which would be, according to the New York State Board of Elections, there are 5.1, sorry, 5.2 million people registered to vote in New York City. 
or are you focusing on the number of people who voted in the general in 2018, which is 2.1 million? Which, which is, what, what is our goal? Do we want everyone who's registered to be able to vote or just the previous? What, is, what are we using so as a predictor? We, we plan for 100% attendance. What we can't plan for is how long uh, folks would have to wait because the one thing that everybody, that I understand people get frustrated, but you know what frustrates me? We can't do voting by appointment. People show up when they show up. If everybody happens to show up at six o'clock in the morning, they show up at six o'clock in the morning. Would it be nice when we plan for a poll site that they spread themselves out and come, some come at six, some come at seven, some come at 2.30? We, we don't get to do that. So some of the lines that we discuss in New York City happen to be that the voters of the city of New York have the freedom to come when they feel like. So, so we'll this, be there. Is, we'll be waiting with ballots, and hopefully they'll have a good experience. M many of my previous questions were perfunctory just because I needed to ask them to get to this next point. So you were talking about impossibility. How, how long does it take to scan a ballot with the current machines? Um, the current machines... Uh, have a throughput of 15 seconds or less. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up because I see the, the chair is uh, growing impatient with both of us. So assuming that there's 5,180,155 voters in New York City, which is according to the state voter registration uh, uh, tally as of February. You're including the inactives, I guess. I am including the inactives because okay. we're assuming 100% everyone mm -hmm. can turn out. That is They can't over vote on the scanners. You know that the inactives will have to vote on affidavit, right? Yes. Okay. So, so, so we're back over, to the 4.6. So, sure. I, will, I can put in, I can plug in 4.6 into my little equation here. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so let's just say 4.6 even uh, because what have you. So over nine days, that's 511,000 votes, give or take, per day. And if we do it at 37 poll sites, that comes out to 13,813 voters per poll site per day. And let's just assume eight hours every day, which you still haven't assured me because you, you may do less on weekends at five. Uh, but that comes out to 1,726 voters per hour, which comes out to 28 voters per minute, which comes out to two voters a second. And that's just not possible at 37 poll sites. So, so is it your, I want to make sure I get your premise correct. Your expectation is that all of the 4.6 million voters will vote early and nobody's going to show up on election day? You, you just said we're assuming 100% turnout. I'm just trying to work from your assumptions to back end how we get to something that works and that is possible where we don't have two people voting a second. So if the assumption isn't 40, isn't 100 percent, if our assumption is 50 percent, whatever it is, we just need to know our assumptions because let be, let's be very honest. In a democracy and even in a corporation and private sector, sometimes we fail. But if we agree on what the goalpost is, then we can work our way from there. So, so, so and again, I know uh, you, you weren't here earlier, but we have um, discussed this issue with respect to early voting with numerous other jurisdictions who have vast uh, experience with this uh, that are similarly situated to New York. For example, Miami-Dade's about the size of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. they, they all tell us the same thing, that early voting takes a while to catch on. And they've also told us, do not bite off more than you can chew. Because the last thing that you want to do is create a plan that uh, fails and that creates suspicion and doubt and lack of confidence on the part of the voters. So you can overbuild something and it won't fly. So. So, so is perhaps the 2.1 number a better number? Is it 1 million? And even in, in all the cases, when you do the math with, let, let's just assume the 4.6 million because you said 100 percent, it it drops the number of voters by a third. You're, you're talking about having to do 10 voters a minute instead of right. 20. And then, multiply, and then multiply it by 0.2, and now you maybe have a real number. Multiply so, your 2.1 by, because you, you, you're speaking as if 
No math calculations have been done at the Board of Elections, and that we came here today waiting for some pearl of wisdom to be dropped uh, on, on our desk. But take 2.1 and multiply it by 0.2. And they, now maybe you start to approach a number, and then multiply that 0.2 and spread that number out over your nine days and see what your calculation tells you. Uh, we're still looking at uh, 2.63 voters per minute and uh, right? quite a lot of... 2.63 voters per minute. Now, that, if we had set up an early voting site, I don't know, that had 20 check-in stations and 10 ballot-on-demand systems and you had 2.3 voters a minute, would there be 20 check-in stations that could accommodate 2.3 voters a minute? If they're going to be... There's 900 at, minutes in a voting day. Because we okay. could do math too, right? Yes. So there's 900. This minutes is what I've data. actually wanted to do with you for five years. Right. So, <laughs> can we do it across a desk? <laughs> I, I sure. So, but I guess the question is, could we do it at 100 locations instead of 37? Because the throughput issue I have in my district is you can only have 300 people in most rooms at a time, so, and so Mr. even Counselor. if you have 20 of them, 20 machines you can't put more than 300 people in that room to go through those 20 right. machines. Manhattan being the center of the universe as we know it is, uh, is going to present us with the biggest challenges. I, I would actually say Brooklyn because right. it's a, it has more votes. Well, actually, it's really Staten Island, but we're not going to get into that. I was being deferential. Uh, uh, but but ch Manhattan is going to provide us with the biggest challenges in terms of uh, identifying uh, suitable locations just by its very makeup. Now, that having been said, we know, unfortunately, that there's been some retail flight out of Manhattan. And there might be sites that we are presently not thinking that we can use, but we might be able to use. And as we discussed earlier, one of the challenges that we have in that regard is we need to work with the Law Department and Department of Citywide Administrative Services to change the uh, sure. leasing uh, uh, procurement process to accommodate short-term leasing uh, for, um, for early voting purposes. Now, all of that can happen. It all can happen. The question is, and this is the, what I would ask everybody to focus on, what is reasonably likely for October 26th? Not where do we end, where do we start? And that's what this conversation needs to focus around. Where do we start and what's reasonable for a starting point and then what's reasonable for a phased in 100% uh, implementation? I, I, I don't think 37 is reasonable. I think 100 is far more. My nightmare is you, are, are you considering like Barclays and Javits Center and just trying to do that? Because yes. Because that's my nightmare. Yes and yes. That's my nightmare. And we were already refused. Well, <laughs> well no, probably it's not going to work out because uh, the Javits Center has already given us pushback on, on, on being a potential site. Uh, thank you to the chair for his indulgence. No problem. Uh, and just for a point of clarity, you haven't, this not a determination. As, as a matter of fact, you're 37, you're looking to see what's going to be the reasonable numbers. Correct. Just, it's, a work, it's a work in progress. Okay. We're, we're, we're gotcha. 11 weeks into a, into a very, very complicated process. I have some clean out questions here at the end, but council member, uh, Jaeger, you had a 30-second statement that you wanted Thank to Thank you. Uh, just first, uh, uh, this wasn't the plan statement. Just to be clear, though, uh, Brooklyn is the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> But the Bronx. Uh, any particular. I, I say the Bronx. Any particular the Bronx is the section of Brooklyn land. that's oh, more close to the know. center? I think you know. <laughs> um, uh, but I do, I do want to state for the record, just to make sure that it's, it's very clear, and you can go back and, and tell your commissioners this, that here in the council, um, when we vote at a stated meeting of the city council, and today you're having a stated meeting of the board, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, we don't put our agenda out early. Uh, I'm a council member. I walk in. I have no idea what we're voting on, or I can guess on most of them. Uh, but but <laughs> half yeah, half C, it's fun. Um, but surely at least a third of the agenda is not locked in stone till we walk in, look at our desks, and see the agenda sitting there. And anybody who tells you otherwise is not is not being completely accurate. No. We get hints about certain <laughs> things that we're going to may potentially vote on. The public has no idea what we're voting on till they turn on the, ta the, the, the video and start watching us do it. Um, and I just want to make sure that your commissioners are aware that uh, they don't have such great disappointment here. If anything, they're just simply emulating us. Okay. And uh, on that, uh, I, I'm sorry that we've kept you beyond this 
start of your meeting, but I hope they're waiting for you. So the one other thing is we talked about all this, the challenges. I, I would like to say uh, one thing I didn't mention is uh, the state did make available in the Chapter 53 uh, $10 million in aid to localities money uh, that will be divided uh, according to a formula established by the State Board of Elections as well as $14.7 uh, million in capital projects earmarked towards electronic poll books, again, pursuant to a formula established by the State Board of Elections. All of that to be done via a reimbursement program. I want to come back to that because that okay. was going to be my first uh, question. Uh, we know we have another 30-second, you know, you know, they're going to go rebuttal? Uh, uh, <laughs> of course, of course. I got to let you're, them have You're some. off the hook. Uh, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> what I'll say is that the city... The, the city charter does mandate that any legislation the city council votes on has to be uh, laid upon the desks for at least seven days. It is the aging deadline. The charter also allows the council to post what is being aged on the internet. It does get posted. That being said, I do think that the council could do a better job at being transparent. If you are interested to know what the council will be voting on at this dated, things have to be voted on through the committees. Uh, those committee hearings, I believe, usually have at least seven days notice for what will be voted on in the committee. And uh, then it is uh, generally the fair conclusion that if it passes committee, it will come to the floor for a vote. My point, Mr. Uh, my, my, my can I let quickly. you guys have fun afterwards? Real quickly, I, 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 have, if I, may. I have. I have. The problem is, okay, I have well, all the panels here that they've been waiting patiently. You know, we started here at ten o'clock, so I'll let you two have some fun out there. But uh, I'm, if you could give me the short version of, we just you just finished talking about the uh, ten million dollar reimbursement uh, from the board of election for costs relating state board. Uh, from state board. Yep. For the state board, I'm sorry, right. and includes the 14.7 million for an electronic additional, additional book. So we it won't cover the whole 21 million. Well, that's 14.7 for the entire state. state. For the entire state. Correct. So well, how much are you expecting to get out of that? We're expecting that it's going to be apportioned based on the number of registered voters, which puts us in about the 40 percent range. 40 percent. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Correct about yeah. that. 40 percent. So and do the math. Depending on which number they use. All right, so let me move on quickly because this should take three, four minutes. Can you please explain why prior to the passage of the state budget and why CBOE did not engage in any pilot programs for electronic poll books, such as small one uh, in Staten Island to minimize the cost of having to use paper poll books during the pilots? Was right. that state law? So one of the problems that we have is we get criticized all the time for not processing voters quickly enough. Uh, the state law did authorize, uh, or does authorize, the pilot program for electronic poll books. However, you must, you must use them in tandem with a paper poll book. So if we were going to pilot a, a, an electronic poll book, you'd have to sign in on the electronic poll book and sign in on the paper poll book. Now, as, as you know, fetching as that may seem to some, uh, in New York City, when people want to get in and get out, could you imagine? We have a tough enough time getting people in and out signing one device. But if, you, if we were to explain to people, look, right. we're doing a pilot, we're trying to make the system better. I think most right. New Yorkers, um, you know, and just I, I doing a one borough. We could have we we picked a particular election that was not very well attended. Um, my experience as a lifelong resident of New York City is that people have a tendency to be impatient and asking them to duplicate their efforts. All right, let me move quickly. As you're aware, critics of these touch uh, screen devices worry that they're not secure. Do you believe safeguards could be implemented, such as requiring such machines also record a paper ballot that could address these concerns? So the particular device that we had made a request of the state board to consider does have a paper ballot uh, of a backup, um, and but the security issues is part of the uh, certification process with the state. Gotcha. Um, I, I will note that both of these vendors, both of the, the two vendors that are presently in New York State, um, have their devices certified in multiple states. Uh, so, uh, you know, whether it be federal or other jurisdictions. Talk to me about, you know, uh, the state law requires to create a communication plan to inform eligible voters early voting. So talk to me quickly about has the work already began, um, how much money will be allocated, uh, how much uh, such plan will cost, uh, and, and, and funds to ask the city to implement such a plan. Uh, do you intend to host any public forums? Are you involved? Does that involve uh, 
mailings, social media, um, what additional marketing is going to be done? So, um, in advertising alone, uh, we have uh, over a million dollars uh, earmarked uh, <coughs> for that. Um, we also put into our, our bill, even though it's not I mean, into our budget, even though it's not required, the annual information notice that got mailed out now in April covers it. Uh, we're talking about uh, doing a voter notification card regarding early voting as it gets closer to that. Okay. Um, and so between that and other printing, we're talking about another probably close to $3 million in that regard, uh, as well as a robust uh, media and social media plan. We'd like to do advertising uh, along the lines of, um, who was it? Was it the, when they did the uh, city council, uh, not the, the uh, city charter planning, where they did the flip the ballot? We, we thought that that was a very interesting uh, uh, program that they did, uh, you know, public service uh, that they did. Uh, and we're uh, exploring all of that. And we also have uh, uh, we're well on our way with a good chunk of the uh, artwork that's already been mocked up, and we have uh, uh, different things uh, that our vendor has given back to us uh, with respect to okay, public Okay, and outreach. the last uh, sort of question really to one issue, because I know the media can't wait to talk to you, and you have the next uh, meeting. Hopefully you'll get a granola bar in, in between. I had one this morning. Oh. And a banana, and a banana. <laughs> so in February, you know, the, the, the NYC BOE published their website, to their website, the name, addresses, and party affiliations for all of the New York City's 4.6 million active voters. The state election law and rules prohibit information contained to the statewide voter registration from being used for non-election purposes, and federal requires that both the state and the city boards of election prevent unauthorized access to a voter registration list. So those releasing the full voter file for the whole world to see violate these laws and rules. Uh, uh, do you have any way of knowing that these inv individuals are only using uh, uh, the city's list for election purposes as required by law? Please explain why you believe the consolidation of state and federal primaries in June required this publication in order for candidates to petition Petition, could you, uh, could you not have found another election, uh, another electronic means of transmitting the voter files to campaign? So, uh, 5-604 of the uh, election law requires the publication, it says, says the word publication of enrollment lists. The enrollment lists are similar to what you would find in a street finder uh, if you go to a, a poll site, except it also has the voter's name, uh, and the party affiliation. Uh, the reason, uh, the, well, it's the address, obviously, and then the name and then the party affiliation. Um, and it's organized by assembly district and then by election district within, within that uh, document. We typically publish those books. We have to have five full sets in the general office and each of the five borough offices. So for 4.6 million voters, you can imagine stacking those uh, books up uh, is pretty uh, cumbersome. What happened was when the state legislature consolidated the primary from June, from September to June, okay. they moved the enrollment list publication date from April the 1st to February the 1st. Keep in mind that petitions for new uh, uh, for the for the June primary were hitting the street on February the 26th, and we found out about this change on uh, about uh, January the 25th, 24th. Right, all right. All right. So they signed the bill the 24th. I think we found out the 25th. Our um, MIS department immediately contacted our print vendor. Uh, they let me know around uh, February the 1st. Uh, and they told us 10 days to two week turnaround time in, in order to print all of those books. Now, a determination was made to put that information available on the website so that those individuals that were going to begin circulating petitions uh, by February the 26th would have access to that information to create the walk lists. So, so that's problem number one. The other piece of it is it's all public information. So it was not the full voter file. Um, but if someone were to request the full voter file, 
we would have to, by law, turn over that full voter file, uh, either in a printed version, but people don't do that anymore. They, they get it on a disk. Uh, and the only information that we're presently permitted to shield from public consumption is the last four digits of your Social Security number. And the voters should understand that we don't have your full Social Security number. Right. We only have the last four digits. So the last four digits of your Social Security number, your non-driver or driver ID number, uh, from the Department of Motor Vehicles, and because the election law is so progressive, we cannot give out your fax number. Uh, right? Any other information that's in our files is subject to public uh, consumption. Uh, to this day, right? To this day. And then now, what are you going to do moving forward? Well, so so what we did, uh, we, we, we put that information up, uh, and uh, we... We had so seen up until a media inquiry into this matter, we had seen no complaints uh, from anyone uh, that this information was there. As a matter of fact, it's kind of cumbers it was kind of cumbersome to, to uh, review. You'd have to know the assembly district that the person was on, click on that, and then scroll through. I'm trying to right? get you out of right? here. So, so what are you going right? to do next? So what happened <laughs> next is, all right, so yesterday we conducted a conference call uh, with the commissioners uh, with respect to this matter and uh, some other matters. Um, and the uh, executive committee directed that we remove the lists from the website so as to, given that the other need for the list was no longer present. The petition process is concluded. Uh, and since that people were getting upset, uh, we took it down and we put uh, a notification. If you click onto the enrollment list section of our website, it says that these lists are available at the general office and at the five borough offices. And all of that information has and, been removed. And that's for sale? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, well, I'm just curious. How, what are we charging for that? What is it again? For the demo? For the Democratic and Republican parties, it's broken up by AD. Each party book is $10 per AD. For the smaller parties, they're by county, and that's a $15. So you can get the Independence Party in the Bronx for $15. And that indicates triple primer, double primers? No. It's just a straight up? It's just a straight it's, list. Okay, it's not right. filtered in any way. Okay, right. It's just right. a straight list. It's just list. a list of enrolled voters of that political party. Okay. So, listen, I know you have another meeting, and our... Our media have uh, been waiting very patiently here and so glad they're here to cover this important issue. Thank you for, okay. I know you were swamped with a lot of uh, questions, but very informative and looking forward to sitting down with you uh, so we could know what, what our next steps are going to be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And we always appreciate your approach to these things. Thank you. From the Campaign Finance Board, Eric uh, Freeman. Oh, Eric, I didn't know you were here all this time. Come on. I can swear you in whenever you're ready. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to honestly respond to you, council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cabrera and um, my name, my name is Eric Friedman. I'm Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on, on the implementation of early voting and intro number 1282, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, which would require the CFB and its Voter Assistance Advisory Committee to provide interpreters at poll sites in designated citywide languages. In 2010, a charter amendment approved by New York City voters reconstituted the Voter Assistance Commission, a 16-member body with a small staff located inside the mayor's office as the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, situated within the CFB. Uh, the VAC is a nine-member advisory board with appointees from the mayor and the council speaker, along with the controller and the borough presidents. Uh, the public advocate and executive director of the New York City Board of Elections uh, serve as ex officio members. The city charter directs the CFB with the advice and the assistance of the VAC to increase registration and voting, particularly among underrepresented populations and eligible voters of limited English proficiency. 
The CFB's dedicated staff engages New Yorkers through nonpartisan voter registration drives, get out the vote efforts, and voter education programs. VAC meets every other month and holds two public hearings a year, during which we hear from New Yorkers about their voting experiences. As required by the Charter, the CFB publishes a report each year taking a close look at voter participation throughout New York City. Our 2018-2019 report, which is released today, I hope everyone will take a look, includes an in-depth analysis of voter turnout, along with several recommendations aimed at increasing voter participation. Again, we would like to thank you for providing the opportunity today to discuss two important ways to increase voter participation and make city elections more accessible and inclusive. The CFB and VAC have long supported early voting, and we applaud the state legislature for passing and the governor for signing legislation to provide an early voting period for elections in New York State. Allowing New Yorkers to cast a ballot on a schedule that works for them is not only logical, it is also good policy. Enacting early voting legislation is an important step forward, but it is only the first step. The decisions we make about implementation will be key to ensuring this important reform will increase access to voting for all New Yorkers. At our April 3rd VAC meeting, we heard ideas from voters and advocates about how best to implement early voting. We'd like to share some of those thoughts and suggestions before the committee today, and we've also highlighted these in a letter to the Board of Elections. We heard from numerous groups about using a vote center model at the citywide level, which would allow voters to cast a ballot at any one of several convenient, easily accessible locations across the city. States like Texas and Nevada currently have early voting locations in grocery stores, libraries, and shopping malls. In addition to being an efficient use of space, placing early voting sites in heavily trafficked locations also serves as a reminder for voters to cast their ballot. The Board of Elections may want to consider using spaces like borough offices, major transit terminals, libraries, or other public locations that, that many New Yorkers already frequent. Vote centers will require ballot-on-demand technology to ensure each voter gets the options on their ballot that correspond to their home address. We heard suggestions that any ballot-on-demand technology we adopt should be able to be integrated with the BOE's existing optical scanner machines. A ballot-on-demand system integrated with the existing scanners would help voters access their individual ballot with ease, while enabling voters and poll workers alike to continue using an interface with which they are already familiar. Many questions remain regarding how to recruit and train poll workers within an early voting system, including the length of shifts, cost, and additional training needs. What is clear uh, is that poll workers will need hands-on, comprehensive training well in advance of the early voting period. Finally, we heard from voters about the need to educate New Yorkers about early voting. To this end, the CFB plans to, publi to publish comprehensive information about early voting, including dates, times, and locations as soon as they are available and the official voter guide. We're glad to hear the Board of Elections is discussing a robust public outreach program to help New Yorkers navigate the polls smoothly and efficiently during the early voting period. And we urge the council to ensure that these implementation efforts are sufficiently funded. We still must do more as a city to make sure that all eligible citizens can cast a vote. Our analysis of voter turnout data over the past few elections shows that this is particularly true for our immigrant population. The CFB has taken several steps to better reach our immigrant communities. In conjunction with Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, as you heard uh, a few hours ago, uh, we offer voter registration forms in 16 different languages, and we've been increasing our outreach efforts in immigrant communities across the city. We believe the Voting Rights Act, as you've heard, should act as a floor, not a ceiling, for helping all New Yorkers cast a ballot with ease. In our public hearings, we've heard stories from voters who were turned away at a poll site or forced to fill out an affidavit ballot because of a language barrier. Last summer, we testified before the Charter Revision Commission about the need for more poll site interpreters and increased language assistance. The data presented in our voter analysis report out today highlights the need for a poll site interpreter program and better language access. Our analysis shows that turnout is especially low in neighborhoods with high populations of naturalized citizens. It's clear we need to do more to meet the needs of our LEP New Yorkers. As you know, one of the charter amendments approved by voters in November 2018 created a civic engagement commission. One of that commission's key tasks is to develop a citywide poll site interpreter program. 
Intro number 1282 will strengthen this requirement in the Charter by creating a clear methodology to get interpreters to the polls on Election Day. Our initial analysis shows that over 3,700 election districts have at least 50 voting age residents of limited English proficiency who speak one of the Non-Voting Rights Act designated citywide languages, which would require new interpreters in more than, more than half of the poll sites throughout the city. Ideally, a program of this magnitude would be managed by the Board of Elections. However, given the clear mandate in the charter amendment, uh, charter amendment approved by the voters last November, we believe strongly the Civic Engagement Commission should administer this important program. Many cities across the country, as you've heard, such as Los Angeles and Boston, go above and beyond what is required in the Voting Rights Act to reach voters in languages other than English. A city as diverse as New York has a responsibility to do more than just the bare minimum to guarantee that every American citizen, no matter where they were born, has an equal ability to participate in our democratic process. We're very happy to continue working with the council to reach eligible voters throughout the city. We're supportive of any program that engages more New Yorkers. And we stand ready to assist the council, the Civic Engagement Commission, and any and all interested parties in achieving this important objective. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony today. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, let me take a moment to thank you for uh, your work since I have known you uh, for some years now. Uh, your work is one of precision. Uh, you're very attentive uh, to uh, the concerns uh, that this committee uh, has brought forth to see uh, campaign finance board. Um, I have a few questions here. I'm going to read on to actually to literally save time. In VAX 2018 annual report, VAC recommends that translation services be available in languages beyond what is required by the Voting Rights Act. So here's my question. What methodology do you recommend be used to determine both languages uh, cover and poll size chosen for expanded language uh, access? Um, well, I, look, we, we support the recommendation in the legislation we're here to discuss. Um, you know, it, I look, as we heard from uh, the, the folks from Board of Elections who testified earlier, um, you know, we need a strong methodology to ensure that like is being treated as like, right? So, so um, I mean, look, the, the first preference would be, um, you know, to match precisely what's in the Voting Rights Act, but what we have in the bill before us would ensure that um, that in communities where there is a critical mass um, and a defined need, uh, interpreters will be placed there. So you know it, it relies on the existing list that's prepared by the city. Um, you know again, you know the the methodology is uh, I think the important principle. I think you, as you've heard from. Um, again, from BOE is that we have a clear, well-defined methodology going in. Um, this should not be a political decision. It should be based on need. Indeed. Um, so um, we support the way that it is defined in the legislation. Has VAC uh, been in communication with the mayor's office or the Civic Engagement Commission about shared goals related to civic engagement and or voting, and or voting access? Uh, most certainly. We have a, a very good working relationship with uh, the team working on uh, Democracy NYC and I think as, as you know, as, um, and, with, and with the Marriage Office of Immigrant Affairs, as they, they both testified earlier. Um, we've collaborated in a number of projects. We have consulted with them on their pilot program um, mm -hmm. to place interpreters at the polls. Um, and so we expect going forward as the Civic Engagement Commission gets off the ground that we will um, enjoy a close working relationship with them as well. Has VAC uh, hired or work with language interpreters in any of its current activities? So we, um, we work with, uh, with translators to help us prepare a lot of our, our print materials and, and other kind of voter engagement uh, materials that we prepare for voters. We, as you know, um, translate the voter guide uh, into the languages required by the Voting Rights Act. Um, we are discussing ways to translate more of our materials into additional languages as we gear up for this critical period going into the presidential election next year and then the citywide election the year after. 
Um, it, is, it is something that is a priority to us. We have not um, previously been involved in pulse site operations or providing interpretation at the pulse sites. Um, but I think, you know, language, again, as I've said in our testimony, language access is, is an important issue and we, um, we, we dedicate significant resources. To Which it. leads me to my last question. Uh, does VAC anticipate uh, needing additional staff? In light of the fact that this, you know, uh, this is going to be your first experience, um, what is that hiring process going to look like? Uh, you know, I, we have not to date done a, a thorough, uh, you know, resource assessment of um, what will be needed to meet the, the the program as defined by the legislation. But to be clear. You know, the, the VAC, VAC itself does not have dedicated staff. The staff, um, campaign finance board staff, is advised by the, by the VAC. Um, I mean, I think it's important to note the scale um, that will be involved in this uh, with the program as defined by the legislation. Um, and I, I, I think, and I, you know, as I've heard in well, how many the staff you anticipating you would need? Well, I, again, I don't, I don't have a number to propose. Right? Okay. I think that. Um, Again, I think we I would note that um, you know that that the legislation would require translators in half the poll sites in the city. I mean, which is do you know by to... when do you have to know? I'm sorry. Do you know by when do you have to know? You know, so by, sure by when do question. you have to know? This is how many additional staff I'm going to need to be able to hire. So. Uh, a month, two months after the passing of the bill, three months. Well, what are we looking at? If if the bill were to if the bill were to pass as as is written, we would have to come with uh, come up with an answer pretty quickly. Again, I think uh, the preference that we've we've stated in our testimony, and I think as we've heard from others, uh, it is, you know, we. You know, our position is that the will of the voters, as expressed last November, delegated this task to the Civic Engagement Commission. Um, you know, the, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, you know, testified. You know, Commissioner Mustafi testified earlier to the experiences that they've um, that have been instructive for them in, in in kind of running that pilot program and getting it out and around the city. Um, what would be required by this bill is certainly of a different scale than uh, than the efforts they've had. Uh, to date, uh, would certainly require dedicated staff. Indeed, um, would require not not only um, not only the the interpreters at the sites, but a, a staff to to manage and recruit um, um, those those interpreters, uh, a staff to run a training program that would ensure that the folks who are at the poll sites were able to provide the information that voters need in order to do, to to cast their votes. Um, so uh, the short answer is we do not. I do not have a precise answer to your, um, you know, in terms of a number of specific staff, and, and I, I can certainly say that this is uh, a program of significant scale that is being proposed, and and certainly requires dedicated resources and funding. So let me pass it on to Council Member Yeager. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Freeman. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Earlier, how are you? Earlier today, uh, I asked this very question to the administration um, uh, with regard to introduction uh, 1282, uh, which is drafted to require um, the VAC to, do, to administer the interpreter program, which I support, except for the part that VAC administers it, because as you've testified, uh, the voters approved a civic engagement commission, and I agree with you that uh, this program which I believe is a good program, and I do believe that it needs to Agreed. exist, and I don't believe that the Board of Elections can or should uh, m uh, manage the additional piece of it because that's not in their mandate, per se. So therefore, Moya has been doing it, which I thought was great. Now we're going to give it over to player to be named later. In the bill, it says the VAC. I think it ought to be uh, the Civic Engagement Commission. But that leads me to my actual next question. Um, the Civic Engagement Commission's purpose, uh, as defined uh, in, the, uh, in the amendment to the Charter, is to enhance civic participa participation, promote civic trust, strengthen democracy. And I would assume a lot of that has to do with 
registering people to vote, uh, uh, informing them of, you know, uh, required information about elections and things of the nature that the VAC is now doing. Uh, and which brings me to my actual question. Do we still need a VAC? And if so, why? Why can't the VAC be folded? Why can't the VAC's work be folded into the new commission and the campaign finance board go about administering the campaign finance program as it's done for 30 years? And the VAC, which has only been under the CFB's umbrella for the last several years, be under this new commission, which is now a permanently uh, enshrined piece of our charter? Well, um, having, having been Having been at the Campaign Finance Board through those years, I, what I will say is that the VAC, I think, represents a very important, um, plays a very important role in the discourse around voting. Um, you know, I think we heard a lot earlier about um, the administrative needs um, and realities around getting a, a really a massive and significant reform like early voting off the ground. Um, and all of that is, is that is an important discussion. Um, the, the conversations and, and the efforts that I've been a, a part of um, through the through the VAC um, it, it allows a forum through which the, the perspective of the voter can enter that conversation. Um, you know, we we do a lot of work. Uh, just just those committee meetings, um, I think, has has have provided. Uh, a place for voters to come and uh, and have their feedback raised up uh, and agree presented with, to, to the Board of Elections. Agree with everything you said, 100%. Uh, VAC is important. Forms VAC plays an important role. Uh, VAC does important work. No dispute. Why does it need to exist as a part of the CFB and not be folded into the new Civic Engagement Commission? Well, I'll say this. Uh, the voters back in 2010, in their wisdom, uh, approved the charter referendum that placed uh, VAC at CFB. And I think part of the purposes as stated by that Charter Revision Commission, as I recall them, were, were that um, the mission, which was previously underneath the mayor's office, it was important for that mission to be housed in a place um, that was not only nonpartisan and independent from the political structure of the city, um, but where it would have the resources to grow and flourish. And uh, I, I would, you know, I believe, and I'm here to say that it has grown and flourished during its time at CFB. Um, we have engaged in, uh, we have built new programs, engaged in nonpartisan voter registration drives throughout the city, um, reached out to voters um, through our through nonpartisan get out the vote, vote efforts, have been uh, proactively speaking to voters and, and reminding them about important deadlines and efforts uh, and, 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 and election dates. Um, it, is, it is really joined up with the previously existing voter education um, requirements that the board had previous to VAC coming over, as you, uh, I know, are aware. Um, through most of its existence, the CFB has managed the, city, the city's debate program for citywide candidates. We have uh, always, since our inception, had the requirement to publish the voter guide. Um, so the work of voter engagement and outreach um, as it came over uh, to the CFB has found, I think, a really, uh, it has found synergy with those requirements and, uh, and again, has grown and flourished during that time. Right. And we're saying, again, we're still saying the same thing. Uh, you think VAC is great. I think VAC is great. You think they do good work. I think they do good work. You think they've performed a valuable service to New Yorkers. I think they've performed a valuable service to New Yorkers. Why should it exist under the Campaign Finance Board and not be moved into the Civic Engagement Commission? And specifically, with reference to the 2010 uh, referenda, uh, where the voters did move it from being a freestanding agency to under the umbrella of the CFB, I would point out that the voters also once created a board of estimate until they uncreated it, and they once had a 35-member city council until they made it a 51-member council. We once had board of aldermen until we didn't anymore. So the question that I have is, uh, irrespective of the fact that in 2010, the voters were wise enough, if you will, uh, to move the VAC back where, you know, over to CFB. They were also, I believe, the same referenda was uh, them itching to put term limits back because it had been stolen from them. 
Uh, so important to note that that was the same series of events. So getting a yes vote was probably not a real hard shake there. Um, I think, you know, it, last year's overwhelming vote to the point where if, if we are to assume that the voters understand what they're voting for, they created a civic engagement commission to do all the work that is currently being done by VAC. Same question. Why should VAC exist under the CFB and not be moved over to the new commission? So, uh, listen, sure. You. You'll have to speak to the to the folks who de the members of the commission who deliberated last year uh, precisely what you're contemplating, and in the end, uh, created a civic engagement commission that is distinct and separate from the Voter Assistance Advisory Commission Committee and the CFB. Now, again, I know that you, as I do, believe in the, in the matching funds program in the way that um, the potential it has to engage more New Yorkers and bring them into the democratic process. Um, the underlying mission and goals of the campaign finance program align naturally with the efforts of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee to conduct outreach and engage more New Yorkers in the democratic process and ensure that in city elections, at least, it is the voice of the voters and not the power of, of large contributions that decides city elections. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, all right. So with that, we're done. Uh, thank you so much uh, for thank the information. You. We'll move to the next uh, panel. Kevin... Hi. Scotland. Thank you so much, Citizens for Better Elections. Kate Duran, Duran from LMV, New York State. Uh, Susan Lerner from Common Costs. And I want to see Janet Berg. Jared, all right. Jared Berg from, sorry, I don't have my glasses today. Vote early and why? I don't think Susan is here, right? We have two, so we'll take the next two. Okay. Avi Rossman from The Big Word, and Lulu Freistat from Smart Elections. Uh, yes. Yes. So you have uh, three minute uh, clock on, and then we'll ask the question. Yes. Is Lulu here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Oh, were you? You're. Uh, no, no, it's up to. Uh, Okay, do I have any? Right. Rachel Bloom, are you here? I am, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> there is hope. Thank you for waiting. Everybody's been so patient. If you have testimony, you can give to Sergeant of Arms, I'm gonna be okay. who have done a fantastic job all day long. Okay, you may begin. Whoever. Yes, make sure the mic is on, and, and when you speak, that the mic is Thanks. close to you. Th thank you very much. I thank know you. I'm, thank you for I, your patience. Oh, well, you, you gentlemen and ladies seem to have all the patience. Uh, my name is Kate Doran. I am the election specialist here today representing the League of Women Voters of New York State, but my usual hat is representing the City of New York, the, the League of Women Voters of the City of New York. I'm also a longtime poll worker, poll site coordinator, and I um, am usually monitoring the commissioner's meetings, so I'm familiar with the operations of the Board of Elections. Um, the League is a nonpartisan political organization which working to promote civic responsibility through informed and active participations of, participation of citizens of government. In New York State, we have 48 local leagues actively engaged in their communities and working to help voters understand and participate in elections. 
The right of every citizen to vote has been a basic League of Women Voters principle since our founding in 1920. So, um, preparing for early voting might be compared to the change from the lever machines to the scanners that some of us experienced back in 2010. Uh, it seems, though, that in that case, the preparation went on for many, many months, if not years, selection of machines, etc. Now we're only, we're not even six months away, and most of the preparation is pretty much invisible to, to the public. I mean, what we heard today, this morning. Um, we have many more questions than answers. Many of New York State's 62 counties will need only one early voting poll site, according to uh, Zellner Myrie and the um, registration records that the State Board keeps. This is certainly not the case in New York City, and we understand that the legislative finding underlying the early voting statute is that one early voting polling site should meet the needs of up to 50,000 people. But then it limits the maximum number ma mandated by statute to just seven. So we believe that if the board just sites, just selects seven sites in each, each of the four boroughs and then one at six in Staten Island, that there are going to be many, many voters underserved. But I did listen carefully to Mr. Ryan this morning, and I do understand the need to roll that, things out slowly and do a good job, not to really mess it up out of the gate. So um, we're concerned, though, are all the New York City counties going to have equitable access between them? I think Councilmember Kalos was trying to get to that. Will Queens have more than Brooklyn, for example? Well, they, several months ago, I stood up in front of the commissioners and asked them to involve the public in the site selection process. Mostly, I was met with a kind of stony silence, but um, uh, one commissioner said to me that he thinks that the uh, legislators in Albany didn't really understand the process and that it was a logistical nightmare for them. Now, we understand that 2019 is likely to be a low turnout year, but we would really, really urge the board to designate the largest number of sites possible given the constraints of the ADA compliance, voting equipment, and available poll workers. Shall I just, 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 <laughs> all right, we've heard nothing at all about poll worker training. So we're concerned about recruitment, training, and compensation. What are they going to do? Now they pay poll workers by the day. I don't think they can do that. We look forward to the plans for uh, communication. The statute says that each board shall create a com communications plan to inform eligible voters of the opportunity to vote early. We have not seen a plan of any sort. And we hope we have confidence that the board will comply with the statute, which does not say when such a plan must be made public. So we urge them to do a draft very, very quickly and incorporate public input and I hope council input in any final version. Um, machines and systems are a really tricky, tricky part of this whole process. The League of Women Voters strongly supports full and equal voting rights for all eligible eligible citizens, including persons with disabilities. We heard Councilmember Rosenthal talk about that. And we in the League have been involved in this since way back in the Hava days. And back in 2005, we adopted a statement of criteria on the subject, which came down to secure, accurate, recountable, and accessible. In 2010, we added the word transparency to the standards. And in 2005, we endorsed the optical scan machines because we believe it best meets the criteria. That machine coupled with a ballot marking device for voters who need such a device. And we hope that we're going to get a system which is just as secure. Now, I have a couple of other things, very specific things that, that we stand for with regard to testing and protection of machines, but I won't, I won't read any of that. I'll let... And I just hope that uh, the New York City Board of Elections will take advantage of the support that you ladies and gentlemen are offering and that we in the good government world are offering as well. Okay. I think I just need one, right? 
Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience and your time. Uh, my name is Avi Rossman. I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in Flushing, uh, currently residing in Nassau County. Love raising my family in this great mosaic of New York. Um, I'm here representing a company called The Big Word. Um, I work as the language service lead in New York City. We're an international interpretation and translation company. Uh, the Big Word is a pioneer in this industry, starting nearly 40 years ago, currently helping students throughout the New York City public school system gain access to important interpretation services that further their education. Uh, we are working in all the languages uh, that have been mentioned here, you know, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Bengali, Russian, Haitian, Creole, Polish, French, Urdu, and Arabic. We do also have access to um, close to 200 languages. Uh, you have my written testimony in front of you. Uh, what I would say, you know, listening um, to the last few hours of testimony from the various council members and the questions and answers that came back and forth, um, what I would suggest is, and there was one comment about people and do they wish to do business here in New York, we do. Um, and we currently do and we wish to continue. One of the things, um, and we understand the RFP process and we're happy to participate. Uh, we're happy to advise on what is available out there as far as translations, as far as interpretation. One of the things, it's, it's on my phone now, is an app that we've developed called the Word Sync app where if I touch a button, I can get in about 30 to 45 seconds an interpreter in over 100 languages right here, right now. Um, the logistical nightmare of setting up having actual people who will understand who what language needs to be spoken at hundreds of different polling sites across a city like New York is very, very cumbersome. Embracing that, obviously you know where you need Spanish, you know where you need Yiddish, you know where you need Bengali. But if somebody walks in who is new to that neighborhood and that person can't vote that day and you have a machine there, you have an app, you have an iPad that can push a button and access something for that particular voter, then you've exceeded what you were expecting. That's currently available and that's, you know, this is in a pre-planned world. Um, in my personal life, I volunteer as an EMT. I've had people in the back of my ambulance and I've wished that I can communicate with them. I have very strict protocols. I can't administer life-saving medications as a basic EMT unless I first confirm certain things. But they don't speak the language. Asking a 12-year-old boy to translate on behalf of their father is not something that I want to be doing in an ambulance. But that's life and death. That's what we do. And that's what's currently happening in non-preplanned situations. So on the broader spectrum, trying to get language access as it's a hot button topic, which really doesn't get addressed often enough. It's across the country where, you know, we should be leading the world in this particular topic. And right now we can offer you video remote interpretation where ASL can be set up in advance. It's very challenging to get that done, um, to have I think someone mentioned having ASL available at every single polling location. That's a challenge because that's one of the most finite resources you have. But once you embrace the technology that's available, you know, we would be happy to advise, to partner, and to participate in any sort of RFP um, and help New York City, you know, move this process forward. Hello. My name is Kevin Skoglin. I work as a cybersecurity consultant, and I'm the co-founder of Citizens for Better Elections. I'm also a member of the VVSG Cybersecurity Working Group, which is setting the standards for the next generation of voting machines. And I'm here today to offer three recommendations that handmarked paper ballots should remain New York's preferred voting method, that New York should use the equipment it already owns for early voting, and that New York should develop a ballot inventory plan for early voting, which includes both the pre-printing of paper ballots and the purchase of ballot-on-demand printers. Now, I only have three minutes, so I'm going to cut a lot out of this, but uh, I was heartened to hear uh, Mr. Ryan say that ballot-on-demand printers is now something that they're seriously considering and the path they seem to be headed on, and I'm glad to see that there's ballot-on-demand printers next door for you to take a look at. Um, that's something that you should be doing so that you can stick with handmarked paper ballot systems. But at the same time, I'm very concerned that there's also touchscreen ballot marking devices next door and that they pursued this as a possible avenue um, as a solution to early voting. Um, and the fact that the contract for voting machines is up in 2021 and you're going to be looking potentially for new systems at that point makes me think that these points still need to be made. The gold standard for resilient evidence-based elections is hand-marked paper ballots for most voters counted by an optical scanner inside the polling place with a ballot marking device or BMD in every polling place for any voter who wants assistance marking a ballot 
and routine risk-limiting audits of the results to provide assurance that the outcome is correct. Why is it the best? A hand-marked paper ballot system produces reliable evidence which can be recounted and audited. It costs less, has shorter lines, and is more secure and resilient to problems. The voting system is less dependent on technology, which is vulnerable to malfunction and manipulation. Most voters do not have to trust a machine to mark their ballot or need to verify that it was done correctly. It is also more universally accessible because, many, because voters can choose the voting method that they prefer. A ballot marking device may be preferred by voters with disabilities, but hand marking may be preferred by voters who are less comfortable with technology. And shorter voting lines are better for many voters with physical limitations. New York, of course, already uses this kind of system, and over the last eight years, it's become familiar to, vote, to New Yorkers. During early voting, with the new challenges, it doesn't change the fundamentals that I've described. Handmarked paper ballots are still the preferred voting method. It's also familiar to voters and to poll workers. And it's not necessary to spend a lot of money to make your current system suitable for early voting. The optical scanners being used currently can be configured to scan ballots for multiple precincts or for multiple ballot styles. Multiple languages are also easily supported. Ballots printed in two different languages seem different to a human, but to an optical scanner, they're similar. The optical scanner observes the position of a marked oval to record a vote. And in fact, if you look at the current ballots, there are already multiple languages on there. Um, and it's the position of the oval that matters, not the, the text that's next to the oval. As I mentioned, you should invest in ballot on demand printers and also preprint ballots. I was a little concerned that he was talking about having ballot on demand printers and not also the other component. I think it's important to have both for resilience. So that if something does happen to the ballot on demand printer, you have the paper ballots. Or if you've preprinted paper ballots and you run out, you have the ballot on demand ballot on demand printer as well. So having both is an important component. Um, each ballot on demand printer would be capable of printing ballots for multiple precincts in a variety of languages. It reduces waste and provides flexibility and resilience. It can replenish ballots. It can print infrequently requested languages to accommodate all voters. And a ballot inventory plan should also include procedures to ensure that voters are given the correct ballot for their precinct. I just briefly want to list some of the other cities, to my knowledge, that are doing something similar. Albuquerque, Boston, Baltimore, Cleveland, Denver, Los Angeles, Phoenix, Raleigh, San Diego, and San Francisco. Boston is noteworthy because they use the same ES and S, DS200, and Automark, and early voting was recently added for the 2018 general election. They preprint ballots in the most commonly requested language and then offer support for other languages on the Automark. They don't do ballot on demand. They should. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I'm very concerned about the ballot marking devices and the, the possibility of using those because there are major, major differences between that and the, the ballot that is currently being used. First, the expense is much higher, and the number of voters who may vote at one time is going to be limited by the number of machines that you have. So you're going to have a slow voter that holds up the line for everyone else, and long lines, of course, frustrate voters, cause voters to feel rushed when voting, and can depress turnout. All computers are vulnerable to hacking and malfunction, power outages. Um, requiring BMDs puts vulnerable technology between voters and their ballots. If machines fail, then ballot marking has to stop. And touchscreens commonly suffer from problems like vote flipping, where you touch for one candidate and it flips to another candidate. Uh, and hacking is a significant threat, um, not just by foreign nation states, but also by local adversaries and insiders. And then there's this additional step of verifying your ballot. This is what the, the express vote ballot that they were considering uh, going to looks like. And you can see that it has barcodes at the top. Those are actually your votes. So when you, when you choose your candidates, it, it prints them as barcodes here. And then it also prints a summary down here. Now, of course, humans can't read or verify these barcodes to make sure that they're correct. So it makes a lot of voters very uncomfortable. How do I know that it's counting my vote correctly? And you, you, if you go online, you'll find lots and lots of voters expressing a lot of concern about that. But the ballot summary is also a problem as well. The ballot summary can be hard to verify. Uh, it uses abbreviations. Some of them will say Proposition 1, yes. Proposition 2, no. And it, you have to remember. And that's challenging for anyone but especially for people where English is not a first language or they are, you know, uh, have less education. Uh, maybe they, they even have a hard time just reading. So the, uh, the National Academies of Science and Medicine recommended against ballot marking devices, I mean, against these kinds of vote summaries. They say, unless a voter takes notes while voting, BMDs that print only selections with abbreviated names and descriptions of the contents are virtually unusable for verifying voter intent. 
So more expensive, longer lines, vulnerable technology. Voters dislike the ballots, and experts say it's poor evidence of voter intent. So I think that would be a step backwards for New York. So just in closing, early voting is an exciting step forward for New York. It will make voting more accessible to all residents and make government better reflect their voices. It's essential that New York not take a step backwards at the same time. My hope is that you'll build on the progress and invest in ballot marking, ballot on demand printers to supplement your existing hardware. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Cabrera, uh, Councilman Yeager. Um, my name is Rachel Bloom. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Citizens Union. We are an independent and nonpartisan democratic reform organization that brings New Yorkers together to strengthen our democracy and improve our city. Um, we thank you for the opportunity today to hear, come and talk about how we should best implement early voting in New York City. Um, we are heartened uh, and delighted that early voting and electronic poll books have passed um, and signed into law statewide, and that the mayor has recently offered up um, so much funding in order to properly implement it. Um, I'm going to try and be brief. Uh, I know there's a lot of people still waiting, um, so I'm going to just hit on our, our biggest things. Um, so we strongly favor expanded polling sites. The legally allowed minimum number of poll sites is simply not enough to facilitate robust early voting. There should be a framework for expanding the number of early polling sites that ties the placement of early polling sites to districts. Um, we believe that there ideally should be one early voting site per assembly district. Um, and in addition to that, we think that poll sites should be prepared for surge times and be adequately staffed. Um, they need to be centrally located and uh, close to public transit that is running when early voting is taking place, which is actually something we need to think about in New York City. Um, this is especially going to be true if people are assigned to early voting locations and not just being allowed to vote anywhere in the borough that they choose. Um, uh, another thing that we want to talk about and which we've heard my colleagues talk about um, is, is a little bit about the machines and generally pacing ourselves. Um, we recommend that the Board of Elections not introduce new machines during the same election or elections that early voting commences. We have strong reservations about procuring an entirely new system of voting machines at the same time as that New York must be recruiting and training poll workers on how to run early voting and use electronic poll books for the first time. In addition, new machines would require a substantial amount of public education to the voters at large about how to cast their ballots. Um, in general, when it comes to machines and how we best think we should implement early voting in New York, we support ballots on demand and believe that all votes cast must have a paper record. Um, and that moves some into, uh, I talked a little bit about your, uh, before, is about robust public education. Um, as we've known from past experiences in New York, New Yorkers aren't the best when things change about how they vote. Um, we've heard today about some of the problems that happened when we switched from the lever machines to the scan to the ballot marking um, devices. So we've already, New Yorkers are clamoring for early voting. This is incredibly popular. People are so excited for it. But they need to be educated about how it's going to be run, how it's going to operate. This is especially going to be true if people are going to have to be assigned an early voting location um, in their borough. So we need to hear more about what is going to be happening with that early voting education. And that's part of also what I was saying about, um, you know, we need to focus on one thing at a time with the voters. We can't be giving all of these new things at once. It's just going to... Um, add more complications. And finally, I just want to um, hit upon poll worker uh, training and recruitment. We have a real problem recruiting enough poll workers in this city as it is. Um, we need to be thinking and um, uh, really pushing and doing that recruitment now. We're going to need people um, for many more days. And that needs, and they also really need to be trained. And, and as I said, you know, between the electronic poll books, um, and, and early voting, it's going to be it's going to be substantial. A lot of these people, uh, it's going to be a big shift for them, and a lot of them, you know, aren't as technologically savvy as other people. So, how we're going to make sure we have enough recruits? Whether we could look at city workers, um, it's something that's been discussed. Uh, we think, you know, potentially should be looked at again. But um, overall, we just want to make sure that when early voting is introduced and implemented, it runs as smoothly as safely. Um, 
and people understand how it's going to work, that they aren't surprised on election day or on the days running up when they can vote early, and that it's um, as positive an experience as it can be for all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. As a matter of fact, I, I was just thinking uh, right now is an excellent suggestion that maybe uh, the Board of Elections should have a video uh, that they will have online that people in the website uh, and even put it on YouTube and all those so, all the social media and it could be part of their communications cam campaign on how to actually use the machines um, and so that that you know I, I could see that taking place I'm just wondering if we keep postponing my fear is next year is going to be the general election that would be like the, the worst year uh, to to work out the kinks. Uh, this coming election uh, in November, which is usually the least uh, the least participation that we see, probably will be the one that will make sense. But I agree with you 100%. We have to be prepared, and that's that's what I was pounding on all day long. When you say keep postponing, sir, what is it that you mean? No, I thought I heard you mention that we're doing this perhaps a bit too fast. So it was maybe I misunderstood. No, I was saying we support ballot on demand machines. What we don't support is procuring, you know, like some like the electronic touch screens in the oh, room I got next you. door. I got you. Um, which is that. We minimize the changes to the way we vote uh, as we are introducing early voting, and we try and keep the system as similar to the one we have. Um, as I agree with it's you. Sort of I one agree one with you. change at a time. And and I heard you, <laughs> and that. that's one of my concerns: cyber uh, security. Dominion is the one that I saw. And I was able to, you know, before this hearing st uh, get started where you have the ballot, you actually fill it out, you have the record there, because I'm always afraid, you know, of hacking, and, I, and that was gonna be my next question. How, how real is hacking? Are, this, are these systems in a network? And if it's not, how would somebody be able to hack if, <coughs> if you don't have uh, you know, kind of a network kind of a system? Yeah, good questions. And those are common questions that you hear all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, first of all, that any voting machine is vulnerable to hacking. Any computer is vulnerable to hacking. And as a cybersecurity person, you sort of start with that premise. The question is, you know, what tools does your adversary have? How motivated are they to to get involved? And do they do they gain something out of it? And I think with elections, and the vast resources of foreign nation states especially, you have to look at that as a real legitimate risk factor. Um, the, as far as how machines can be hacked, none of, none of the actual voting machines are on the internet all the time. There are some states that allow machines to go onto uh, cellular modems to communicate results at the end of the night. Um, and that's something that is uh, discouraged and we're actually asking to uh, have uh, become a um, part of the voluntary voting system so let, guidelines let to say that there, you can't do so that. So you could help me understand yeah. this. If you don't have that option, let's say we decide that it's just in-house. And never connected, yes. Never connected, can it be hack? Yes. How, how, so there are a number of ways. Hack if, you know, there's a, there's a distance mm -hmm. You know, you have police officers looking around. You know, somebody's uh, in the laptop. I would imagine sure. that will be kind of a flag. Yeah, there there are a number of, of kind of main pathways that, that you would look at. The first would be um, an insider, an in, insider threat, right? And the, who's who's in charge of maintaining custody of these machines and how easy is it to, you know, slip them some money to get them to give you access or something. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is often these machines are left unattended in polling places overnight before elections. And in some places that can be as much as two weeks ahead of time. Uh, in some places it's you know only overnight. But um, often they're unattended and they're put in places that are not particularly secure locations. They're in schools and you know other places that have been rented for a short period of time. But in those systems cryptid where you know you have a security system, I mean, what, there are protections. It's kind of very difficult. There right? are protections, but those protections are software protections. And those, I mean, 
So anybody there would be no hacking if, if software was a solution. There would be no hacking, right? right? Gotcha. So um, so that there are ways around. You can build walls, and that's good. You should build those walls, and you should build multiple layers of walls to protect you. But that doesn't mean that you're you're going to repel every defender. One of the the truisms of cybersecurity is if you're the defender, you have to win every single contest to keep them out. But if you're the attacker, you only have to win once. Once. And then you, you mentioned other ways for hacking. Um, phishing emails is another common one that you get an election official to click on an email. They download a virus. It's now in the, the system. Uh, if that computer ever goes on the network, even a local network, it can potentially be infected. Uh, the voting machine can be infected. And then the, the media, the removable media from those machines also gets moved from the voting machine back to a, a main computer, back to the voting machines, and potentially can spread things. And then the last one, which we really don't know how to secure well, is supply chain. The fact that these machines could be arriving you know, with chips that were manufactured overseas. Most chips are manufactured overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough problem to solve. So we assume that they can be hacked, but that shouldn't discourage us because that's why we have paper. That's the whole idea behind having paper, is that you can take paper, you can feed it into an optical scanner that's full of malware, and then you can do an audit at the end and detect that there was a problem. That's a goof and that's the fundamental reason that, that we're so insistent that we have to go to paper and get rid of the paperless machines. Gotcha, very good. I wanted to ask you a question regarding uh, your, the app uh, that you have. My question is, if I go to the site and I am before me, and um, an iPad is put before me, nobody else speaks the language, how am I able to communicate uh, does your app does voice recognition into a language? Because I, I hear that we're not there yet. When we had the hearings regarding 311, um, that, that issue uh, came up. So currently the app is set up by uh, your nation's flag, your home nation's flag. So someone would be able to find the flag of their home nation, click on that, and then pick the particular language that might be spoken in that language. That's a lot of flags. Yeah, scroll straight through. Um, you know, if we were working, you know, if we were working, you know, on developing something particular to New York City, you know, we could work with our development team to say, hey, we want these a 10 on top. We want this search bar to say this. You know, it's a very, you know, right now out of the box, that's how it's, you know, but let's say I only spoke, you know, one language and you can't, you know, you're interacting with me and you can't even guess the language. Right. You know, I don't speak Spanish, but I hear it. Right. You know, I don't speak Yiddish very well, but I hear it. Um, so those are I can identify those languages. What happens when you can't identify the dialect? That's how we've um, that's how we've gotten to that point. Have you spoken to the Board of Election about your product? Not not as yet. We will. No. Okay. Great. Great. Councilmember Yeager, you have a question? Yes, sir. No. Oh, fantastic. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, we have one more panel, we only have these two left. and we have. Oh, Lulu, welcome Lulu, and actually Jared. Jared, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Jared Berg, feel free to come forward. Did you have? Did you want to come back? Did you want to come back? Okay. Yes, Amy Torres. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Amy, Amy Torres. Chinese American Planning Council. Great. Fantastic. If anybody else wanted to uh, testify, make sure you see the Sergeant of Bar because this is uh, the last panel. Great. You may begin. Now, can you hear me? That sounds better. Okay. My name is Lulu Freistat. I'm the Communications Director for Smart Elections. It's an organization that coordinates election security uh, groups as well as other election reform communities. Uh, and we work with some of the top security experts, election security experts in the country. And what I want to talk to you today about specifically is security, election security. Because I heard a lot of enthusiasm here today for early voting, and I heard a lot of information about 100 polling sites, 37 polling sites, polling sites in grocery stores. And it's it's exciting, but it's also concerning. I've 
uh, covered election security for over 10 years. And I can tell you that it's going to be extremely challenging to secure a voting machine in a grocery store. So these voting machines, some of them have USB ports on the front of them. For example, the Dominion Ice that you were looking at, that you were excited about, has a USB port right on the front of it. And literally what that means is that any person could walk up to that, put a USB drive in there, literally 10 seconds later the machine would have malware on it. And that malware would not just be um, it would not just be on that machine for that election. That malware would remain on that machine for every election that the machine was used in here from there forward. And the machines have um, devices that go in and out of them for every election. There's uh, memory cards that put firmware on them, that update the firmware. Memory cards that take the election results off of them. Malware travels on those media, on those memory cards. So if someone puts a, a malware program on one machine, then that malware program can travel from machine to machine in the course of normal election procedures. And by the end of that election cycle, you could have malware on every machine in the county from one person having access to one USB port in one location. So this is just to say to you that this is very, very serious. And as um, Kevin said to us, the attacker only has to win once. So uh, I really, there was something else that um, happened here today that really concerned me. When Michael Ryan spoke to you, he said that they are using their vendors not only as salespeople, but he said, of course, it's important that they have to use those vendors as technology experts. And that is actually a major problem. Think about it. When you go to Best Buy and you buy a new cell phone, do you just trust that salesperson to tell you about the problems with that cell phone? Or do you go on Amazon and look at the reviews and see maybe there were some other problems? Yes, we all do that. So we don't want to be buying millions of dollars worth of voting equipment without checking in with someone besides the vendors for those security problems. And I really, I wanna be in touch with you. I'd like you to work with our organization. As I said, we have really great security experts working with us. There are people in the city like Hari Hursty. Hari Hursty lives in New York. He is one of the top hacking experts in the country. And we wanna be involving people like that as we pick voting equipment, as we establish security protocols. Because that type of testing, um, it's called red hat testing or penetration testing. That's really what tells us whether or not a machine is secure. And in general, the vendors do not want you to do that type of testing on their machines. That's why you have to talk to election security experts. And um, I just want to tell you a few words of warning about these machines next door. Um, the Dominion Ice machine in particular has a very serious security problem with it that um, experts have identified where the, the machine is both a printer and a scanner in one. So the ballot from um, somebody who just fills out their paper ballot travels under the printer head after that person already cast their ballot, which means that if malware is planted on that machine, the ballot could literally print extra votes on that paper ballot, making that paper ballot no longer a valid reflection of the voter's choices. And you understand how incredibly serious that is. Yes, and we have that same problem with the other ballot marking devices on the market. The Express Vote XL, in a, it's, the hack works in a different way, but it's the same problem, and the Express Vote Hybrid. So newer is not always better, right? Sometimes hand-marked paper ballots and some of the older systems actually can have fewer security problems. So we want to really be working with our security experts to ferret out those problems. And also, our group is very interested, um, and we work with uh, members of the disability rights community. Uh, we have disability uh, advisory teams, and our disability advisory team. And one thing uh, that we found out is that they, the disability community does not like the Dominion Ice machine. And actually it's for the same reason um, that it holds up traffic. It's because that machine it, uh, is a, it's a ballot marking device and a scanner in one. So you have somebody voting on it, a, a voter with a disability, right? And maybe it takes them 15, 20 minutes to use that machine to vote. Meanwhile, the line is backing up because people need that machine to scan their ballots. And that makes the, the voter with the disability uncomfortable and nervous. They know people are waiting on them. So that machine actually, there, were, there was a letter from five separate disability organizations to the State Board of Election in October asking that the machine not be certified 
They were so against it. And I understand similarly with the Express Vote XL, which is another one of the ballot marking devices, that there were many, many problems uh, from the disability community with that machine. So uh, I look forward to being in touch with you. Please um, take a look at our website. It's smartelections.us. And we have a video investigation there now, five minutes to watch, and it will show you some of the problems with that Dominion and the other hybrid voting machines. It's a three-part um, series. We have two more parts coming out, and I look forward to sharing those with you. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing here. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and Councilmember Yeager. Thank you for continuing to hold this space. I know it's been a long day. Um, I'll speak briefly because I don't have my testimony in front of me. Um, Amy Torres, Director of Policy at the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. CPC is the nation's largest social services organization for Asian American Pacific Islanders in the country. Each year we serve 60,000 New Yorkers across our 30 sites. Um, one of the big activities that CBC does across our range of human services is voter outreach, education, and engagement. This is a yearly activity that we embed, thank you, that we embed into our services. And um, we even use our community volunteers to reach other Asian American Pacific Islander voters across the nation for um, communities where we know the, the AAPI community is growing but does not have a place like CPC to do sustained voter outreach and education. Um, this fall for the midterm elections, we engaged our youth volunteers to be calling districts in Houston to do nonpartisan outreach in language. And a number of our youth volunteers said, I can't believe all the people that we're calling said that they voted early in Texas and we don't have early voting here in New York. Um, and so we were very grateful to see that this session, you know, um, early voting passed, that there was funding included for it, uh, but CPC still holds very grave concerns about implementation, many of which we were happy to see um, you bring up in your questioning of the BOE today. Um, so I don't want to fully rehash everything, but uh, the number of sites and the positioning of sites is critically important. We know that um, for early voting implementation to truly be successful. I understand the security concerns, but it really needs to reach the hardest to reach communities and those that are least likely to vote um, on actual election days. We know there's a misperception that AAPIs are apolitical, but after the 2016 um, election in a national voter survey, only 33% of Asian Americans said that they had been reached out to by either a partisan or nonpartisan affiliated organization to remind them to get out the vote. So really placing these early voting sites in the places that people habitually frequent where people already go to find community is very, very important. Um, and in order to do that, we need far above the minimum number of sites. Um, so we really hope that the BOE feels compelled to take up the administration on their offer um, to fill that gap. But even once that happens, um, we know that the existing experience on election day remains subpar for non-native English speakers. And I want to thank you, Chair Cabrera, that each time you speak about language access and um, you know, accent stigma, that it really speaks to an experience that people still have um, today here in New York City, despite our language access plan entering its 11th year. Uh, we know that there still is a lot of stigma and a lot of work to be done to improve language access. CPC is a recruitment partner for the BOE positions, um, and so we have uh, members of the community who have filled those positions, but we know that the amount of training um, and the scheduling is sometimes challenging um, in addition to the payment to go out on election day is insufficient. Uh, we've heard from the BOE a number of times that they'd like advocates to push for higher rates for so that they can recruit and retain those interpreter positions, which is why we are shocked that when the city stepped in to provide its own interpreters that they would turn them down. Um, so, you know, we want to thank the city and then we also want to thank the administration for their, their work to fill that gap. Um, but we also want to make sure that any implementations for early voting really need to have both the, uh, both the locations that are meeting the community where they are and staffed appropriately because if someone decides to go to an early voting site and has a worse experience than they already have it on election day, um, that experience gives us a very short turnaround time to the April 2020 primary. It's just under six months. So the amount of time that we have to look through those problems, hold the oversight hearings like 
uh, had happened earlier this year and actually turned that around into um, one of the most <laughs> contentious primaries that we're, we're going to have, regardless of party affiliation, is really critically important. So we want to see a robust um, plan put in place for uh, the election this fall. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I have to run, so sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, my name is Jerry Vadamala. I'm the director of the Democracy Program at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, ALDEF. Um, ALDEF was founded in 1974. Our mission is to protect the civil rights of Asian Americans through litigation, advocacy, community education, organizing. Um, we do a multilingual Asian American exit poll every major election. Uh, we've been doing this since 1988 are by far the largest number of um, voters that we survey are right here in New York City. We also monitor poll sites for compliance with the Voting Rights Act, Help America Vote Act, and, and other provisions of law. Um, one thing that we've noticed through our exit polling, uh, we surveyed over 8,000 Asian American voters in 14 states in Washington, D.C. in the last midterm election. Um, about a third of all Asian Americans that we survey self-identify as limited English proficient. And that varies depending on which ethnic group we're talking about. South Asians typically have much lower LEP rates, so they don't need interpreters as often, uh, with the exceptions of w with the Bengali population. They're the sort of one outlier among the South Asian population. But then you have the Korean community with LEP numbers as high as 60% or some of them even, depending where we are, above 60%. Uh, so it really varies depending where we are geographically, also which ethnic group we're talking about. Uh, you know, We've done a lot of work around uh, language assistance, language access. I litigate sec um, cases re revolving around Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act and Section 208 of the Voting Rights Act uh, nationally as well as here in New York City. We support all efforts to expand language assistance. Uh, so we support this legislation. Uh, there's one specific thing, though, that I, you know, I noted this in my in my written remarks. Uh, there's a line here in the proposed legislation where it says the committee shall provide interpreters for all designated city languages, pursuant to Section 23-1101 of the Administrative Code. This is the important part here, excluding those languages for which the Board of Elections in the City of New York provide interpreters. That is problematic to us because. Um, Yes, for counties that are covered under Section 203 that provide interpreters, that's fine. The, the city doesn't need to provide additional interpreters. But it shouldn't exclude those languages in other counties where it's not covered, right? And my, my, our example here is Bengali. Bengali is covered in Queens County, but it's not covered in the Bronx and Brooklyn. And um, I provided the attachments here to you. I made 20 copies. But um, these are the letters that we sent over the years to the various boards of elections, pleading with them to provide Bengali interpreters at targeted poll sites. Not every poll site, just targeted poll sites. So in the Bronx, we listed out, it was four poll sites there, right? Yeah, Park Chester, East Chester. In Brooklyn, we listed, I think it was three sites, right? Uh, so we've been asking for years to please provide Bengali interpreters because we've do, we're doing the exit polls. We know that there's a demonstrated need for language assistance there. So for this legislation, we support providing uh, interpreters, but this one line here is very problematic. We're asking that that be altered or amended so that you could close that loophole here and provide interpreters for Bengali as well as possibly Chinese or Korean, which are also covered for only specific counties here in New York City. I did need to correct the record also here uh, on the Bengali ballot lawsuit that was brought up earlier. Right, we brought that lawsuit. I was a lead attorney for that case. Uh, it's one of the attachments here. Uh, it's a second, second to last attachment. I urge you, please read that complaint. It fl flies in the face of the, what was testified here earlier. Uh, we sued specifically because the board was not complying with Section 203 to provide Bengali ballots. They just did not provide them. Uh, Mr. Richmond brought up the fact that Asian Indian is not a language. That's correct. We sent uh, numerous letters to the board urging them to designate a specific Indian language. There were numerous meetings. In April of 2012, the board designated Bengali as the covered language under Section 203. We had one, two, three, four consecutive elections without Bengali ballots, and that's why we sued. All right. 
only after we sued did we actually uh, obtain Bengali ballots for the first time in New York City. So it was through the legal action. That's why we sued. The, the board was not providing the language assistance which was required. Uh, we also attached um, another lawsuit back from 2006 for failure to comply with Chinese and Korean uh, requirements under Section 203. It's, it's a good read. You can read of all the uh, the violations of law that took place over a course of numerous elections, which we were able to document through our poll monitoring and our exit polling. Uh, so there's a lot of issues here in New York City with not complying with what's uh, required under the Federal Voting Rights Act, which is the floor. There's nothing preventing the city from uh, providing more interpreters. Uh, last point, I know I'm over the time, the argument that there would be an equal protection uh, lawsuit brought is is pretty outrageous and pretty ridiculous. I, I don't see that happening. The key here is similarly situated groups, and you address that concern by having a formula, which looks like you have a formula here in the legislation. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, let, let me start with you, and then I'll come to you, uh, Lulu. Uh, thank you for this suggestion, number one. Uh, we're going to look into that in, in, regarding in the bill. Uh, I, I work very closely, though it's outside of my district, but I have many friends uh, in Parchester with the Bengali community, very close friends. Uh, and I, I, I was assuming, I, I should not not assume, that... Uh, the same provisions that are given in Queens would have been given in, in the Bronx. No, and thank you not. for yeah. in, giving us light uh, to uh, that issue. Second, if you could uh, relay this uh, litigation uh, information to Council Member Traeger, I know he will be very, very grateful to you yes, it's, to it's, pass it's, it on it's, to it's him. That's right. It's all in the attachments here. If you um, could just... You know, get it to his office, yes, request a meeting with him. I know he'll be more than glad to hear, uh, especially your primary source. You were right yeah, there. Right. And I would tell you, um, I actually included an email with the board also in my attachments where, where we forward our letters that we've sent repeatedly begging for Bengali interpreters in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. Their response was, the board only covers what is federally funded. As you know, Asian Indian is only covered for Queens County. So this is a problem we've had for a long time. Let's see. Um, and this legislation, we support it, but it doesn't address the problem that we have. It actually kind of exacerbates it right. and says, well, you're covered. It's covered under 203, so it's going to exclude that language, which is a problem. And, and I think uh, Council Mayor Traeger will be more than glad to yeah. look at that uh, because of the in unintended. Yes, uh, right. Uh, outcome that we can end up having. Lulu, I wanted to ask you regarding, do, is there like data out there uh, in terms of how many times nationwide have we seen hacking that actually took place, uh, they were successful or attempted? We were actually talking about this earlier today. Those numbers fluctuated radically at one point they were saying i think two of the voter registration they they know dhs did actually release the fact that two voter registration databases in the states it was illinois and new mexico i believe were successfully attacked there and that's been documented and actually 60 minutes did a program on that um there were the number varies sometimes you'll see 21 and sometimes you'll see 39 states that uh dh said also were probed usually is the word that's used um, and those are that was the voter registration databases, which we under which is what we're getting now. Now we're moving to those electronic poll books. So, for example, I know that they said they were looking. Michael Ryan said they were looking at a vendor for voter registration databases. I worry, is it VR Systems? Is that the vendor they're looking at? Because VR Systems isn't was known to be hacked. DHS said that they were hacked, and then there was a known incident in Durham, North Carolina, where a client using VR systems voter registration voter registration database had an incident that um, the New York Times reported seemed very much like a hack. And that was where um, voters came to vote. And when they signed in to register, they were told that they had already voted, even though they hadn't. And this was just a quote unquote glitch, right, in the electronic poll book. But that glitch actually caused um, 
hours and hours of lines. And what happened in, in Durham, this was in the 2016 presidential race, because they had so many problems, they decided to switch to um, paper uh, registration again they were not prepared they wound up with one like paper registration poll book uh, which backed up the lines even more they had paper forms that people had to fill out they wound up actually literally like going to a copy center during voting hours making copies of that form that people had to send out to fill out bring it back there were like hours and hours of lines and um, many many people left the polls and what happened in North Carolina was a race that was supposed to be neck and neck between Clinton and Trump Trump won by four percent and this, they think, was quite possibly because of this problem in a Democratic stronghold in Durham, North Carolina, which is uh, understood to be most likely from a hack. So and now with the voting machines, there is very little known about whether or not voting machines have been hacked because nobody really does that sort of forensic analysis. If you parse the DHS language very closely of their report, you will see that it says that's not their job. They basically say, not a job. So they say, as far as we know, no results were changed, but basically nobody looked. Um, one thing that Kevin mentioned, which is incredibly important, is about audits. And I work with the Democratic Lawyers, um, the New York Democratic Lawyers Council. I'm the head of the audits working group. And we've been working for two years to develop risk limiting audit legislation. And we're really interested in starting a risk limiting audits pilot. And maybe, you know, some of the precincts or some of the districts here in New York could be part of that. And it's something to really think about. We really need to be moving past the, th the 3% audit that we do right now. That 3% audit only tests, um, it's 3% of the machines. It's not 3% of the ballots. It doesn't um, audit provisional ballots. It doesn't audit absentee ballots. So it's very faulty. And what we really need, especially when we're moving into more dangerous territory with more machines out, is we need more testing to make sure that those machines are counting accurately. So we need, there's another bill um, at the state legislation that's um, been presented now. That's a bill to allow um, automatic recounts for close elections. I encourage you to support that. And uh, again, to um, maybe work with our group with the New York Democratic Lawyers Council to bring a risk limiting audit pilot here to New York and move to a, a strong statistical audit of every election, of every race, so that we can have, that's the point of a good audit, is to do that test and see, were, was the correct winner declared? That's is, what we want to know. Is there a way that it a third party, I know this is a task, but it's worth the value of democracy that at the end of the night, before uh, before we get the data, we get the count, uh, that we could quickly verify that there was no malware uh, that was installed in the machine. If only it would. It, it, when you're talking about these machines, you're talking about some real challenges. One is that it's proprietary software, and the vendors don't want anybody looking at that code. And even if you could look at that code, it's thousands and thousands of lines of code, and you could be looking for like one little tiny line of code gotcha. that something. It actually it can be a very simple program that moves votes from one candidate to another. So it's it's actually not the kind of thing that you could do like literally following an election. Kevin is probably um, better, um, he's, he's a computer expert. I'm just a computer security journalist. Um, but uh, it's very tricky. It's very, very hard. That's one reason why we want to go s to protect these machines so carefully. I really recommend you look into videotaping the like surveillance cameras of the machines at all times. And uh, also the ballots. What are we doing to protect those paper ballots? Because an audit is meaningless if you haven't had strong chain of custody of those paper ballots. The ballot on demand machines, they need to have very careful security protocols that show every single time a ballot is printed. Those ballot on demand machines can print ballots that are already filled in with ovals for a candidate. So you could print hundred thousands of ballots already printed out and slip those into the, into the other ballots. and. You might have a problem with your count, and somebody would go like, oh, we've got some extra ballots here, and people would be confused. But at the end of the day, those ballots might be counted. Well, that's a big issue, so, though. If, if you if have a different count versus right. that, that's a big red flag. But maybe yeah. you go through and you pull out 1,000 ballots that aren't your candidate, and you slip in 1,000 ballots that are your candidate. If you don't have a strong chain of custody, 
You have no way of knowing. So these are the challenges that early voting is going to bring to us. They are already challenges even within an election day uh, system of protocols. Early voting makes these issues much more difficult. So yeah, we really want to look at that chain of custody, the ballot on demand technology. And as you said, like, you know, what can be done to see if the machines, if there's a problem with them? That's again a question I would refer to somebody, I would say, let's talk to Hari Hursty. You know, because he's real, a really a brilliant hacker, and he might be able to tell us what we can do to look at them and you know and set up some protocols with us. So let's be working with people like that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was very informative, and this is actually information that we could use. Thank you. Can I get your a card afterward, and we can be yes, in touch? Yes, afterwards. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And with that, I want to thank uh, the staff. This worked so hard. Uh, in preparation during and then thereafter and, uh, and for everyone who participated with that with that and of course the sergeant of arms both of them uh, who do an excellent job with that we conclude today's hearing